lots of slaves now, Chair. Okay, um, thank you, Clerk, and good morning, members. I would now like to declare today's meeting of the Health Committee open to the public online. I would like to welcome all of our members who are participating by video conferencing this morning. And can I remind members about the protocols regarding the use of electronic devices? Can I also remind both members and any panel appearing in today that a sound quality is greatly improved with use of a headset? And if people can ensure that they are on mute when they're not speaking, that also helps the sound quality. So thank you for that, members. Uh, we have received no apologies this morning. Are members aware of any other apologies? No, thank you. Moving on then, members, to chairperson's business. The first is issue item I want to raise is a meeting that myself and the deputy chair did with the British Heart Foundation in relation to soft opt-out organ donation. Um, so I, uh, we met with a number of them, and I suppose they, they raised their concerns. I will maybe ask you to come in on it as well, Pam, but they were basically making the point that what, what really is needed here to make a significant change to the levels of donation uh, is legislation, um, and we, we indicated that, that we we as a committee would, would look very positively and would do everything we could in relation to that uh, when the legislation is brought forward. There has been some increase in rates, however, we are well behind other areas across the islands, and um, particularly Wales, which has which has went the soft opt-out route and has seen, seen figures increase increase very, very dramatically. Um, and I also want to acknowledge all of those people out there who continue to campaign on the issue and who are themselves trying to get the a organ donation improvements in the system. And I, I'm thinking this morning about, about Dahi, of course, um, and everyone else who has campaigned on this issue. And I suppose uh, just to also generally just encourage the public, even if the legislation hasn't been brought forward, if public could have the conversation um, with their families, if they're if they're willing to be donors, make that clear to families so that families are are comfortable and content and aware of their wishes. So I think that's that's an important message. Pam, do you want to say anything about that meeting? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Yes, it was a, certainly a good meeting. Um, I didn't, you were breaking up quite a bit there, Colm, at the start, so I didn't get everything you were saying, but I think it's important that we do remember that uh, it's important to, to sign up to the organ donor register and to have that conversation to make our wishes very clear. And I would actually um, um, very much like us to be um, chasing the department to see what work has, what, uh, an update on, on where we are organ donation because obviously there's a, a campaign around that and there's a lot of work that needs to go on in the background regardless of any legislation to ensure that organ donation is maximised. I think that's very vital and I'm thinking especially of the likes of We Dahi um, who, who needs that new heart and, and he can't do it but he needs that new heart so I think it's important to, uh, that even if you are progressing down the road of legislation that that we certainly are, are doing all we can to, to promote and encourage donation in, in the interim time. Um, so, a good meeting. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Pam. And um, your sound actually was, was, was poor as well. So, just if I can ask all members to ensure you're muted there. Um, Kara and Jerry, maybe I don't see like it might be on my screen, but I don't see mute indication there. So if members can please just take a second there and check that you're on mute. Um, okay, thanks, thanks for that, Pam. We will then go to the other item that I wanted to touch upon in terms of church business was the Medical Health Awareness Week uh, motion that the committee brought forward. Um, I think it was a very, very powerful debate in the chamber. Um, I think I think the, the the very powerful evidence that we had taken across the week fed into that debate and was reflected in the debate. I have to say, um, some very very powerful contributions from individual from individual MLAs and from members of the committee. And I have to say, uh, I want to thank and congratulate everyone for for just the the content and and the tone and the the. Uh, the progress and, and the and the kind of collegiality of that was, I think, striking, and I think does speak to the determination all of us have to get actual uh, improvements in terms of how we deal, how we provide services for people who badly need services or mental health. 
So do members want to make any comment then in relation to the debate or the, or the Mental Health Week, just in relation to reflecting on any of that? No members are content. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, members, we'll move on then to our minutes, um, and I refer you to draft minutes at, ta uh, at tab 3.1 there. Are members content with the minutes? Yep, content. Thank you. And there are no matters raising members from the from the minutes for last week. So we're going then to our first substantive uh, briefing session this morning, members, which is a uh, briefing from the BMA on access to GP services. This briefing was requested recently, and myself and the deputy chair agreed that this should be on the agenda as soon as possible, given given the very many uh, issues that I think we're all seeing in uh, in the in the in the community. So I would like to welcome now by video link Dr. Alan Stout, and Dr. Stout is chairperson of GP committee of the BMA here in the north. So good morning, Dr. Stout. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. I can. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, and we seem to be hearing you. We seem to be hearing you there, fine. So we we haven't received anything um, from you. But do you want to give us a briefing, Alan, and then we will maybe go to some questions and answers from members? Yeah, if you're if you're happy, Chair, I will certainly give you a short briefing uh, to begin with, and then happy to take any questions after that. Perfect. Okay. Well, go go ahead. And go go ahead, please. Okay, thank you, and, and good morning, Chair, and, and good morning, members, and, and thank you for the opportunity to come before the committee today uh, and really to address the main issues that are consistently being raised with regards to GP access. And if I may, I'd, I'd like to begin just by setting the context, because I think you're all aware from before uh, that the pressures that general practice has been experiencing for many years, uh, and namely the ever-growing workload uh, with a decreasing and a constrained workforce uh, and subject to, to limited funding. Uh, these issues are cl quite clearly still there and indeed have been exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, so as well as continuing to provide the service uh, that we always have to a rising population, uh, patients are now also presenting with increased numbers of comorbidities and complex needs. Our aging population needs more ongoing care and the sheer size of hospital waiting lists mean that patients who should be seen in a timely fashion need to keep returning to primary care for treatment while they are waiting. Add to this the COVID-19 restrictions, which have rapidly changed the way in which we operate practices uh, for the safety both of our patients and staff. The staffing of COVID centres to ensure that we can safely operate a parallel service with those with symptoms, uh, and also the hugely successful rollout uh, of the vaccine programme itself. Uh, we've given all of this, it really is phenomenal that we've managed to deliver all of this uh, in what has been the most difficult, intensive and stressful 17 months of our professional lives. Of course, the way in which we've delivered this care has changed. Uh, we've had to be innovative, we've had to be creative and flexible to ensure that we're able to continue to, to deliver care to our patients in a safe and a sustainable way. It's both reassuring and astounding that no practice has had to close during this period, and indeed the numbers of patients we've seen face-to-face -face and virtually continue to rise and actually have risen to, to pre-pandemic levels. We've had great feedback from many that being able to see their GP virtually uh, has actually made us more accessible. But of course, we do recognize that others do prefer uh, or need to be seen in the room and make absolutely no mistake where this is necessary, this continues to be the case. However, as I referred to earlier, the way general practice has been delivered in recent years has become unsustainable. For us to be able to meet the increased workload with a decrease in workforce and limited resources means we'll have to continue to be innovative, creative and flexible. GPs have always been focused on solutions, which is why in 2015 we created federations. There are 17 in total across Northern Ireland, uh, and they had 100% sign up by all GP practices and were actually initially self-funded by these practices. When we proved that the model worked and supported practices, the board were then able to come in and provide assistance and make them more sustainable. And an early success of this was the practice-based pharmacists, and now every practice has access to a pharmacist through the Federation employed model. 
We continue to develop these support plans through the rollout of multidisciplinary teams uh, to add not only pharmacists to primary care teams, but also importantly, physiotherapists, social workers, mental health workers, and the potential for many more. Uh, these have proven to be invaluable and have increased the size and the repertoire within the primary care team. However, due to constrained funding, currently only set, or sorry, currently only five out of seventeen federation areas have fully resourced MBTs, and so despite the success, an inequity has developed. A number of years ago, BMA also lobbied for an increase in the number of GP training places, seeing the need of training uh, more GPs uh, as the workforce continued to age, neared retirement, and many newly trained GPs preferred uh, to explore portfolio careers, meaning that they often work uh, in, in general practice less than full time as they fulfilled other roles within the health service. Full credit to our previous health minister who confirmed this increase, uh, but actually by the time the number of training places had increased, general practice had become such a challenging environment to work in that the training places were actually very difficult to fill. And in fact, this year is only the first year since that increase that the places are fully subscribed. Uh, but we are actually now in a place where even these 111 training places are not enough. BMA has also lobbied heavily for many years for a second medical school, and we're delighted that the first intake of graduate medical students will be entering Ulster University at McGee this coming September. But it'll obviously still be at least nine years before we see these students graduate as fully qualified GPs. So without trying to be too negative, I hope that I've laid out the challenging environment in which GPs work uh, and what we have proactively done to ensure that we're able to continue to deliver a safe and sustainable service to our patients. GPs and our staff, like all healthcare workers, are totally exhausted, but continue to be totally committed to serving our patients. That is why it is particularly difficult to listen to daily criticism of our work. We've never worked so hard and yet still find ourselves in a position of needing to defend ourselves and reiterate the message that GP practices are not and never have been closed. I'm here today uh, to urge you to get this message out loud and clear to society in general and to your constituents, in particular that GP practices are open and that we will deliver care in a safe and an accessible way as we possibly can. But again, let me be absolutely clear, we're in an even worse position now than we were pre-pandemic pre and it will continue to be very challenging. Demand is higher than it has ever been. The workforce is decreasing and the funding so badly needed, uh, as you've heard from the Minister and Department officials, is simply not available. The change has been rapid and definitive. It is highly unlikely that we'll have the desire or the capacity to return to a 100% face-to-face model. And the phone first model and the use of technology allows practices to remain sustainable and accessible and indeed provides a better service than pre-COVID. It is still far from perfect and will continue to be adapted, but critically requ requires capacity to deliver. Please be assured that as always, uh, and our GPs and our teams will continue to seek and find solutions and to improve, but until significant transformation occurs, and we all know what that transformation looks like, with the full rollout of MDTs across all areas, the no more silos working, uh, addressing urgent care and improving uh, that element of care, and proper workforce planning and tackling waiting lists, the demand will continue to rise and will continue to outweigh supply and capacity. So thank you, Chair, again for uh, inviting me today, and I'm happy to take uh, any questions. Okay, thank you, thank you, uh, Dr. Stout, and I do want to, you know, acknowledge the uh, the tremendous pressure that all of the health service is is operating under, both pre-COVID and certainly that has been exacerbated hugely as a result of COVID, and also to acknowledge the creativity and the flexibility and the the very um, concentrated uh, actions that have been taken across across a number of, of sites. However, and I'm sure, and, 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 and I, I understand from your briefing that actually this is the purpose of why you wanted to, to, to come to the committee this morning to address some of these issues, and, and that's uh, very useful. But we are increasingly and all over the place, and I think you would probably hear this from other reps as well, hearing of examples where people cannot get through to the GP, can't get an appointment with the GP. I'll give you two examples just by way of illustration, and I mean it by way of illustration. I'm, I'm picking out from literally, at this point, probably hundreds of examples, but for example, 
in Lisnesky, a 93-year-old woman who had fallen. She has isolated herself throughout COVID, has managed to keep herself safe throughout COVID, couldn't get through to the GP surgery at all, could not, could not get through, um, wasn't didn't feel she needed to go to ED and wasn't prepared to take the risk as she seemed of going to ED. One of her family finally went to the surgery and managed to get someone and they were able to come out. They were able to tend to her, to check her over, to make sure she was okay and to send her home safe and well. But that that took significant attention and significant effort. Another case, just to give another example, a case that I have have come across recently in the the Mid-Ulster area, where a young child with a sore throat, a mother with, with three other children, phoned the GP, got through to the GP, but couldn't get an appointment to bring her child to the GP um, to see was it was it an antibiotic that was needed or whatever, was was told to go to the to the uh, emergency department. The only emergency department that was available for her to go to was Daisy Hill. She tried the GP again, but again didn't get a, didn't get uh, any agreement for an appointment and went to Daisy Hill, sat outside for hours waiting to get in, and when she got into Daisy Hill, she was told that she should have been seen by the GP and she needed an antibiotic and was sent home then at that point. And I have to say, we're hearing this all over, where EDs are clearly under tremendous pressure themselves. I also hear of cases where, and and I've heard this, I've heard this used, and this this is difficult for staff as well as patients, but I've heard that of EDs turning people away an impression of, of, of what looks like a war zone, people old, people standing against walls, waiting for waiting for support and help. So in that context, is, is, it, is, is the phone force system uh, getting conflated with what's happened with COVID? And is the phone force system working? And do you recognize that, that, that surely with this level of concern that there is a problem? Yeah, so uh, they're actually very, very good examples uh, and and good examples for for different reasons. And and actually one word probably sums up both, which is capacity. So uh, I I think every single GP wants to be able to deal with those problems that need dealt with quickly, uh, as as quickly as they possibly can. I mean, we are GPs, we're here to to help people. The example of the the 93-year-old lady is a a particularly good example because, I mean, I think what that demonstrates, number one is the capacity issue. So we need more phone lines, we need more staff, we need that ability to take all of the calls. And when we hear of a call like that, and I think the outcome actually demonstrates that quite well, we will react and we will deal with that quickly. and, and I think what you, what you described was the GP went out, did the assessment and, and reassured them appropriately. So the, the absolute critical point of, within that is that point of access, that ability to get through and to, to get the help, uh, which will be so, so provided so well. The second example you give me actually uh, fills me with fear because that just is not right. Uh, I mean, that is not a case that should be going to ED. Uh, and it fills me with fear because it just rings massive alarm bells. Um, the, that is bread and butter stuff for, for general practice. An awful lot of that actually with phone first would be dealt with with advice over the phone and self-care and sore throats. Most sore throats don't need an antibiotic. Most need advice a little bit of time, symptomatic management, and they will get better. They, they, uh, an awful lot of them don't need to see a GP at all. An awful lot of them absolutely do not need to end up in an ED department. Uh, and I think what that is demonstrating uh, and and I would be worried about geographically the area that's coming to because I referred to it in my briefing that we knew before pre-pandemic that we had practices in really significant difficulty um, and, and we know that they still are in significant difficulty uh, and I think that is, uh, is, is ringing an alarm bell that we don't have the capacity there, we don't have the staff there uh, and we don't have the, the ability to deal with what should be dealt with in primary care, in primary care. Yeah, yeah, and and, and similarly, I have to say, I am am filled, and and I mean, I I can't emphasize enough how many of these are coming in from right across, right across the area. And I have to say, there are other, in fairness, there are other reports where there are GPs who who are doing very well and providing, so there is a huge disparity about how this is rolling out and how it's, how it's hitting the ground. Um, And I think that needs to be, that needs to be considered. 
the other thing then, given the capacity issue, given given the COVID pandemic, and and I did I did note the other day. I think I heard Patricia Donnelly, I think, uh, uh, saying that to date of the million of the over million vaccines that have been administered. Um, and that's hugely welcome, I have to say, and congratulations to everyone, including GPs, um, who have been so heavily involved in that in that campaign. However, I think she said that somewhere over six hundred thousand of those had been had been uh, delivered by GPs, and over seventy thousand by community pharmacy. But is that best use of a GP resource if we have if we have six hundred thousand? Um, vaccines being delivered by GTEs. And I raised this with Patricia Donnelly when she was last with us in, in, in the context of asking her, were they continuing to recruit uh, a workforce out there that could deliver the vaccine to take pressure off GPs, particularly in light of that we may be looking at, at a booster campaign in the autumn when we may be also looking at a further resurgence of COVID-19. And, and I was... I, 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 we were told basically that there, was not, that there was nothing that GPs would be able to, to do that. Now, also, the committee here have passed legislation uh, and considered legislation which would allow other people to assist with vaccines. So is it best use of GP time to be delivering vaccines? And should we not be delivering more of the vaccines outside of the GP system to allow GPs to facilitate the appointments? Okay, so that's a, a very good question. And, and the answer to that is, is actually yes and no, and I'll explain. Um, so you, you, GPs themselves have raised this concern and actually the point that we are now at in the vaccination program, uh, we practices have the option uh, at the moment in terms of continuing the first doses uh, at, at, in the cohorts that we're in at the moment uh, as to whether they opt in or opt out. Uh, and again, it is reflecting just the pressures and making sure that we have our GPs in surgeries developing or delivering general practice. The, the reason that I say no uh, as well is that the it is w been well proven, and actually the, the previous flu campaigns and now the COVID uh, vaccine campaign actually demonstrate just how successful general practice is at delivering, delivering at scale, delivering at volume, and also delivering high percentages. Uh, and the percentages is it's not only the million plus uh, people who've been vaccinated, it's actually the percentages of the cohorts that have been tackled uh, that are absolutely mind blowing. Uh, I mean, we're sitting at 98% in some of the age cohorts. Uh, and, and part of that is because there is the public understanding and the demand to get the vaccine, but GPs are persistent. Uh, they will target, they know their population, they know the at risk, they will target them and they will uh, d will deal with them. So it's a wee bit like a push and a pull. Uh, if you have a mass vaccination centre and you have a public announcement, people will self-book, uh, you know, and, and but you might not get as many. Whereas if you really try and pull those people in and target those people, uh, which GPs are so good at, at historically doing, that's when you get the, the massive success uh, rates and the, and the very, very high percentage of, of people vaccinated. So I think there has to be a balance there, uh, you know, in terms of, you're absolutely right, protecting workforce and protecting people doing the, the right thing, but also making sure that we get uh, the greatest possible success from the, from the vaccination programme. Yeah, and, and and I and I do I do I got I got my own vaccination with my GP, and it was a very very impressive uh, operation, uh, very very smoothly done and all of that. But I was struck when you're at the same time hearing so many constituents telling you they can't get access to GPs. You are struck, and I'm, I'm also struck by your own uh, reference early on there, Doctor Stuck, to the ever growing workload and the workforce decreasing and the complexities. And all of that, and also the success of the MDTs where they exist, and I recognise, and we will come back to the inequalities that that are inherent where they don't exist. But surely this is another discipline of those multidisciplines, vaccination. And I'm also aware, I have to say, of people who have tried to become vaccinators and have struggled, people who are retired nurses who want to help in the effort. And the effort, I think, has to be continued now out into this, what is a continuing emergency of primary care because of the ages and the things that you have outlined for us. So this to me, and you've mentioned physio and you've mentioned uh, social work and those other things that can take pressure off a GP. 
I just feel that we're missing a trick here in terms of taking pressure off GPs around a willing and an available workforce on vaccinations. So that's that's something that I think. Uh, but I do think I do think there needs to be a. You, you, you do need to consider how is it that that there are so many uh, people who are reporting not being able to get access or not being able to get access at all or appointments following access. But anyway, I'm going to go to members now. And at this point in time, I'm going to go first of all to our Deputy Chair, Pam Cameron. I then have Paula, Jonathan, Carol and Alan uh, in, that, in that order. So I'll go across to Pam. Go ahead, Pam, please. Thank you, Chair. And thank you, Dr. Stout, um, for your uh, attendance today and also um, for the, the work that you uh, and your colleagues and staff have been doing throughout this uh, pandemic in particular, um, but also in general. And I know uh, that um, it's, a, it's a tireless amount of work that, that, you, that you're under in very difficult circumstances. And there can't be any dispute also around the increased workload that your profession has and will likely continue to have um, in, into the future. So thank you for that. Um, I think communication is always um, challenging and um, changing perceptions will always be difficult. And I think as politicians, we know that more than most. Um, could you tell us how uh, you think uh, issues around GP access can be addressed? And, and I'll give an example. The last time I made a call to uh, GP, uh, it took me 125 calls to get through to reception. Um, and not everyone's able to cope with that type of system. If you're elderly or if you have a mental health issue, uh, just a couple of examples, or maybe you don't have great technology to use to hit that redial button. Um, and can you tell us uh, what more you believe can be done to expedite reform um, that will benefit GP practices? Um, and what discussions have you had with the minister uh, and his officials in terms of um, making improvements around the main issues of concern going forward? Okay. Um, yeah, the we met with the minister actually just last week, last Monday, uh, and we we raised exactly this. Um, and it, and I think I think your question, your own experience, is very consistent with the problem that we know is there. And, and I think this, and I say we because it has to be a collective we. The solution to this is not necessarily just within general practice or within individual practices that are under so much pressure and have so much constraint uh, at the moment um, because the demand is is huge. The figures are roughly 200,000 contacts per week, uh, which is, is over 10% of the population. So, I mean, it is just astonishing uh, levels of, of demand. Um, and we've got to match that with capacity. Uh, I mean, we hear that about waiting lists. We hear that the the demand and the capacity, you know, don't match, and that's why we get you know waiting lists stretching to to five, six, seven years, which which you know is is clearly unacceptable. No, nobody's ever going to to disagree with that. But it's exactly the same in primary care. Uh, I mean, if we have two hundred thousand uh, contacts per week, we do not. And and I mean, I'll, I'll be. 100% clear on this, we do not have the capacity to deal with that. And whenever you describe 125 contacts, I know that is replicated uh, elsewhere. I know that's why you're getting the feedback. Uh, and that's why we collectively have to solve this. And if we do agree, and it, it, it was it is in delivering together, it's one of the, th the three main points is creating a, a strong, sustainable primary care and that is the extended team uh, as the absolute foundation to everything that we do uh, in health. Uh, I mean, that has to be essential. So, so I mean, it is a plea. It's a plea for your support uh, to, uh, to, to get that increased funding, that increased resource, that increased staff into practices so that you, you or, or anybody else uh, isn't having to, to phone 125 times. Uh, to, to get through. I can't give you an easy answer to that. Uh, I know I know uh, the pressure that, that my own practice is on with, with just uh, the, the constant stream of phone calls coming through. Um, and it, it is capacity. It's, it's as simple as that. I appreciate that. And I suppose in relation to even the examples that the chair gave you there, um, are, are, is there any look at how uh, maybe a, a little bit of additional training might be brought in in terms of 
um, staff at, at the front line through the reception. I mean, uh, I know that the, the the people who work in my local surgery are, are are fabulous. They're really great when you, when you when you finally get through to them. But there obviously are issues in some of the examples that come forward of where advice is actually inappropriate. Uh, and, and and you alluded that to yourself with that case of a sore throat being sent to ED. So, is there any um, is there any thoughts around? Um, some additional training there uh, but my main question um isn't around um the uh the, the cancer uh weights and you know what can the department do to assist um and encourage those come forward who who maybe should be red flagged who maybe have symptoms that haven't been seen or they're reluctant to go to the gp or, or they simply think the GPs are still closed or they think I'm not going to be able to get through or I'll just put it off until I, I don't want to burden the GP, I don't want to burden the service. I mean, what can we do to address that? And um, Have you had discussions with the department on that? Yeah, yeah, we, ha- we have. And, and actually cancer weights, there, there is a, a positive within the cancer weights. So again, if we go to the, to the phone first type of model, I mean, again, one, one of the benefits of that is if, if I have a patient phoning me and they have a worrying lump or a bump or abnormal bleeding or changes or, or whatever it happens to be, that to me is the easiest possible phone first consultation because you, you, the, the, the phone conversation uh, consultation lasts a matter of minutes because you say, I need to see you come down at 11 o'clock, let's see and examine and 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 we will do whatever is necessary so so actually that is a benefit of of this current system is that that any patient who is worried about a a symptom that might be cancer is fitted in is is prioritized and fitted in with their their practice very very quickly uh, and dealt with but then obviously if a word referral is needed we're, we're all familiar with with some of the challenges there um so so that that is a positive um you you're absolutely right as well i mean it is that public message which we try and get out over and over and over again is if you are worried please do contact we don't want people uh you know waiting at home um but but that's where the whole team is important so again one of the consistent messages i try and get across is that we we don't have receptionists we have clinical assistants so the so the traditional role of a, a receptionist uh, you know a plea to to patients is give just a little bit of detail to them they're not going to treat you they're not going to diagnose you they're not going to prescribe for you but what they will do is they will enable that to be prioritized by the doctor um so if i have a list of 50 people to phone back i want to know the one that has the worrying symptom or has a potential heart attack or stroke or uh, suspected cancer or whatever so again that's where we need to make sure that we we have that team working uh, and we need the the public to to understand that 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 people aren't being nosy uh, that that is a, a really really important part of of having the right person seen at the right time okay appreciate that thank you thank you chair thank thank you pam um going then to paula bradshaw uh go ahead paula please thank you Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Alan. Good to see you here this morning. Um, my first question is in relation to the great work that um, was further developed during the pandemic between the GP practices and the community pharmacists. And I'm just wondering what conversations you're having with CPNI and others around how that can actually be um, taken forward and even added to. Thank you. Okay, yeah, and and again, Paula, that's a, that's a good example of how uh, there has been very good joint working. How the pandemic bizarrely has really triggered some of those relationships, that communication, and, and that work that uh, that is needed. And we do have good links with our community pharmacists. Again, you'll get variation, uh, you know, as you as you do with it, with everything, um, but. Uh, I'm just checking. Uh, Clerk, has Alan frozen there? I think he has. He has on, on my screen as well, Chair. Okay, Alan, I'm going to check back with you just as you were starting on that answer there. You froze. Can you hear us presently? I think he's went off the call, Chair. We'll get him back on. 
yet. So I think it's e it's easier if we stay in session for broadcasting, Clerk. Isn't that correct? So we just we just bear with it for a few minutes, and we'll get Alan back on the line. Yeah, broadcast. Could you bring Doctor Stout up? Yeah. Apologies. So Alan, we lost you. We lost you. We lost you there. I don't think you had got very far into the answer to Paula's question. So, are you okay to go to pick it up, or do you want Paula to come back again with the? Question? No, no, no. I'll, I'll pick it up again. That's uh, that's fine. Apologies. I don't know what happened there. I, I got uh, I got kicked out for for some reason. Um, the <laughs> um, it, I was I was just saying it is a really good example, Paula, of of how the pandemic has forced us to work better together. And some of the, some things that we should have been doing for years and years and years, and and you know it has really forced us into that environment. Um, and, and that is something that needs to, to continue. We, we have close links with CPNI and our pharmacist colleagues. Uh, we, we share a lot of the same frustrations uh, as, as well. Uh, and, and what I was saying before, and I suspect you didn't catch it, is that the missing link that I think we all identify is the EPS, the Electronic Prescribing System. Uh, that is a, is a complete and utter game changer uh, for everybody uh, in general practice, in community pharmacy, and absolutely most importantly for, for patients uh, in terms of, of just that efficient uh, use and management uh, of, uh, of their prescriptions. And actually that, it, it provides a better service, uh, but it reduces that nuisance, that footfall, that paper trail, you know, picking up a piece of paper to bring it to a community pharmacy to be dispensed. I mean, that uh, uh, the, the permanent secretary actually said two years ago that that was his number one priority. Um, I think it probably is still the number one priority, but it's a frustration to us all that uh, that it still uh, still hasn't happened yet. Um, thank you, Alan. And my second question um, relates to you used the phrase twice limited funding, and I, I suppose nobody has a blank check in relation to health or any public service. But you know, if more money was available, made available for um, GPs and primary care, you know, how, how would it be spent, and what improvements do you think it actually could deliver? Yeah. It's a it, it's about a primary care team. I actually I don't like referring to funding. I prefer to refer to resource because resource means not only money but it means staff and we have a massive resource in the health service at the moment um, so everything doesn't necessarily need to be additional uh, i think sometimes it is about using existing staff uh, better and, and differently um, but it it is about a wide and expanded primary care team uh, that, that actually starts to to extend into the community um, and and to use mental health and as, as an example of that, I mean, we know the MDTs are involving physios and social workers and, and mental health, but mental health we know is, is such an issue. Accessing and, and contacting your practice should never, ever be a barrier to accessing mental health services. And if we're going to do this right, a primary care team with mental health services should be embedded in the community. And that should be the easy and open first point of access with very clear and direct and easy links uh, for escalation to your practice and beyond to the to the specialist mental health services uh, if need be. Uh, but we have to be capturing people at a much earlier stage before crisis happens enabling them and getting all of the other uh, kind of social uh, support and, and and social elements of support uh, you know engaged uh, which which I mean I'll be honest GPS aren't the best place to do uh, it is very much those mental health workers and the social workers and the the, the link workers and, and community uh, teams uh, you know that are, are vital there but but that if and, and so the answer to your question with funding is exactly that is expanding that team that it looks like a much more patient focused patient facing and community embedded uh, team thank you alan thank you chair thank you paula um going then to jonathan buckley go ahead jonathan with your questions please thank you chair and good morning uh dr Sout. um It'll come as no surprise that, that I'm going to talk about the inequalities across uh, GP services in Northern Ireland. I've, I've been well on record on this topic throughout uh, the COVID-19 period, and I think the examples that have been outlined by the Chair and indeed other members uh, throughout COVID-19 are testimony to the inequalities that exist. Um, so could, could I maybe just ask Dr. Stout, and obviously going forward because there, there was a real there was a real lived out experience by a, a lot of uh, patients across Northern Ireland that 
um, there was a difference of treatment in relation to their access, in relation to maybe what their perceived access was to GPs, uh, phone line services, etc. So how can we monitor and address the reported disparities in access to GP services between different practices? Is work on going to establish an evidence base for this? Because I know when speaking to some GPs, um, the conversion rate from telephone calls to actual face-to-face -face interactions very greatly across the board. And this is something that I think we're going to have to put right at the very heart of the COVID recovery, because I don't for one minute underestimate the huge pressures that are going to be placed in GPs in the aftermath of COVID-19 and recovery. But if we don't have the proper processes uh, in place, I really do fear that we will just be chasing our tail. Yeah, a very important point. Uh, and, and you're right, there is inequality uh, and there there is variance. And there's variance within individual practices. Even if I look at my own practice, we all work slightly differently. Uh, and that is governed by, by any number of things. It can be the pressure that you're under, but it can also be experience and confidence and, and knowledge and, uh, and relationships and, and so on, uh, just in terms of, of how you do deal with things. So I think first and foremost, we have to accept a degree of variance because there will always be a, a clinical variance. But but I think you're you're making a much more important wider point, um, and and again in in the briefing I did refer to it is that we knew before COVID hit and before we were we were ever faced with the pandemic that we have areas that are in huge huge difficulty in terms of sustaining general practice in terms of attracting new GPs uh, in terms of retiring GPs and I'm thinking particularly about the West and 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 very particularly about the Southwest uh, you know where, where we know those are, are big big issues uh, and and they are practices in big trouble um, so what we all we have to do uh, uh, you know you've got a carrot and a stick uh, sort of approach to this I don't think the the approach necessarily is to tell them that they're doing the wrong thing. I think it's recognizing that they are in difficulties. Uh, and in health, when we see spikes, uh, you know, be it in prescribing, be it in referrals, be it in an ED attendances uh, or anything else, that is usually a really strong warning sign that we have got somebody in difficulty and a practice in difficulty. Um, so I think we collectively have to recognize that and we have to put in as much help and support uh, as is possible uh, you know whenever whenever we see that and i think in fairness we do fail to do that on on occasions uh, and we allow it to hit an absolute crisis point where we get to a failing practice and a contract being handed back and and i always and, and the the department officials the board officials and, and myself always agree on this is that whenever we hear of a, a contract potentially being handed back that we have probably failed at that point uh, because there should have been better support uh, you know going in uh, at a much much earlier stage oops yeah you're you're muted i think sorry sorry dr said you very much uh, explained the, the the early symptoms of of trouble that we face within gp services but i suppose going forward i would like to hear a lot more about how both gp practices and indeed the department are going to deal with a uh, uh, you know to establish an evidence base uh, that that we can we can identify the problems much earlier in fact i would imagine in this post covid environment that, that those are, problems are going to be much more uh, widespread across northern ireland and it's, it's important that that we recognize that and get systems in place so could i also ask you do you believe the current graduate and training places are sufficient to address the likely vaccinations in our gp practices in the next few years given that this is going to be an ongoing uh, cycle by the looks of things a very simple answer no uh, they're, they're not uh, and for, for a number of reasons <clears throat> first of all simply to replace the retiring doctors uh, the, the training numbers aren't uh, aren't enough um, and, and we know that uh, the increase to 111 as I referred to was was hugely welcomed and, uh, and and was important but we're now at a point where we need to go well beyond that um, and again it's not only retiring doctors it's young doctors coming through um, aren't are working less than full time they're, they're they are taking on uh, um, 
portfolio careers, portfolio is the word I'm looking for, portfolio careers, where they are working in, in other areas as well as general practice. And we welcome that because we actually see that as a solution to sustaining um, people in general practice. We would rather have 50% of somebody in general practice than 0% of somebody in general practice. Um, so it is important that we have everything in place that, that can support those people uh, as well. But also importantly, if we look to the future, and again, I've referred to, to this a number of times, uh, the primary care, and I, I deliberately refer to primary care as opposed to general practice alone, has to be the foundation of how we transform, how we change, how we get a sustainable out of hospital model. Um, so we're going to need to really expand the repertoire of what is done in primary care to address mental health, to address elderly care, to help to address and provide solutions to the waiting lists, uh, you know, to help uh, with, with cancer care and ongoing reviews uh, and chronic disease management and everything else. So we, we, we know that that is the future model of healthcare. No Nobody in this system, I've never heard anybody in the system deny that that's a future model. And if we are committed to that being the future model, we absolutely have to have our staff where that future model is going to be and where the care is going to be provided. Okay, and finally, uh, Chair, um, you know, I've been well on record regarding my dissatisfaction with some of the GP services throughout COVID-19, but I fully recognize the huge uh, impact that many uh, and the, the workload that has been placed on many GPs uh, th throughout this pandemic who went above and beyond to, to help patients in a very difficult time. So can I ask what mental health support has been made available for GP surgery staff during the period of COVID-19? Oh, very little, very little, and that that is is our fear too. We we have a, a tired, a stressed, uh, a strained workforce, <clears throat> and it, it, what terrifies me is is the the really good people. If you were to ask me to pinpoint your perfect GP, uh, I can give you a, a, a bucket load of those that are going to retire now uh, because of the stress and the strain that they're under. And we have a system that is losing too many good people uh, and really, really good people. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I can't, I can't answer your question because there, there, there isn't a huge amount of resource or support that is there. There are occupational health services and so on, but we need to to address that, and and we need to keep our workforce, and we need to keep our good people. Absolutely, no doubt. With what we've been discussing as a committee about mental health awareness, I think probably the chair would agree with me. Sometimes it, it is easy to forget about those that are actually providing the care to to yeah. the public itself. So, thank you very much, Doctor Sarton. Thank you, chair. Yeah, thank you, Jonathan, and, and absolutely, I do agree. We do need to look after our our invaluable staff, and and actually, retention is, I think, as big a concern now as recruitment. So, I agree with that. Uh, I'll go then to Carol McKillen. Um, Carol, please, Lana Ray, Lesh Well, I'll get carefully. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Alan, for coming in front of the committee. It's very timely given the. Uh, criticism that's building up in the media um, around access to GP services. Um, but just to say, I don't think anybody believes that GPs were, you know, sitting doing nothing during the whole pandemic. So I just want to put that in the record. But it is very real that people can't get access to their GPs. Um, and particularly, as Pam has out outlined, some of the older constituents I've been dealing with weren't even aware that there was an information box on an email. You know, they were posting letters into their GP, asked them to give them a call, you know. And while that's okay up until a point, um, it's it just falls short of what people are are, are to expect. So expectations certainly is something that we all need to deal with. But the issue I have is that two Mondays ago, nearly 500 people attended the Royal Emergency Department and from the hours of four to seven o'clock that evening. A lot of them have been sitting um, and were waiting uh, to get through to GPs. A lot of elderly people who were really, really ill uh, and, and some of them did end up getting um, admitted. But there were also, um, so Mondays are normally the worst days for emergency departments because there's a lot of referrals coming from GPs, okay? Also after hours, who are also GPs, are also feeling the strain as well because 
people can't get through to their GPs. And then there is a lack of clarification around even places like Beach Hall and Belfast. Can people still go there if they're really concerned? And I think this is adding up into a perfect storm of no access or whatever access is there, it comes in an acute end. So I would just like you to clarify that. And then my second question is, I too have concerns, first of all, about GPs being involved in mass vaccination programs when we have mass vaccinators out there at the minute. Um, I'm not saying they shouldn't do any vaccinations at all, but kind of, you know, taking a whole day out to do vaccinations, I don't believe is a good use of time. And my third point is the one, two, three GPs campaign in terms of mental health services. I know in North Belfast, a lot of referrals are made to community and voluntary sector who are also overwhelmed, really, really overwhelmed to the point where they, they too need resources. So, you know, and I'm not like you, it's not just always about funding, but there are certain things that we need to do very, very quickly in order to restore confidence, because I do believe confidence has been not. So I would just like your thoughts on that, Alan. Thank you. Okay, Th thank you. And and, and to, uh, I'll try and go through them in order. I've jotted them down. <clears throat> Actually, I really like your description of the, the first uh, bit and, and the, the link with ED, uh, because that is important. And the way that you've described it shows how the whole system interacts. And that is so vital. So, I mean, there is a big project on, on urgent and emergency care called No More Silos. Uh, and it's called No More Silos because we need to move out of this silo mentality of, you know, it's either ED or it's general practice. You know, there's got to be something, uh, you know, in terms of, of working better uh, together. The 500 people, you're, you're right. I mean, that is, a, is an incredible number. And we've looked into that in, in some detail. And what is is, is actually most frightening about it uh, is that a, a, a significant proportion of, of those patients who attended were category three patients. So category three means that they are actually there for a genuine reason. They need some sort of test and investigation. A lot of them aren't actually admitted, um, but they, they when you when you actually look back on it, you're thinking, well, actually, they do need to be somewhere, uh, you know, so it is beyond what traditionally would have been general practice. The other thing, just to keep in context, the numbers, um, so 500 people attending the Royal ED is not because general practice is closed or because it's not seeing anyone. There are 130 plus practices uh, in, in all of Belfast. And if each of them had sent even one more patient, uh, that would have been absolutely catastrophic. Um, so, so I think even with a big number in one day in an ED department, we've got to appreciate the, the amount that are still being seen and seen in practice and in community settings, uh, you know, far, far outweighs that. Um, and, and I suppose that is my, my main point and my main concern is that we don't want to get into a dynamic where our practices are so stretched that that does look like 130 more or 260 more or 390 more um, because that's taking us into a, a completely different uh, realm. So it, it's, it's really illustrating that the pressure is there right across the board um, and, and the solutions aren't going to be one-dimensional, uh, they will be solutions that, that do involve uh, involve everybody. Uh, and I'm confident in, in some of the, the working and some of the plans, uh, you know, with the with the no more silos in, in particular. Dr. Stout, sorry for interrupting you, but does, does that include some GPs asking for a negative COVID test before they do face-to-face? -face? So that, so that's important. <clears throat> And that's where we were coming on to, to Beach Hall, which was, was your second question. Beach Hall still is there. The COVID centres are actually still there uh, and they're still getting uh, they're still getting significant referrals. They're getting five to six hundred referrals per week, which is actually unusual with the infection levels going down uh, so, so much at the moment. Uh, but we have a strategy at the moment to 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 try and wind those down and try and close those because we need our GPs back in practice and, and dealing with uh, with the day-to-day -day practice activity. But we need to make sure that it's safe and the infection control and, and so on and such like is there. 
But your question on the testing is actually vital in enabling that. So we still have people who are contacting with symptoms that might be COVID. Um, they probably don't need a same day assessment in terms of a clinical assessment. But one of the questions that we will ask in the phone first environment is, have you had a COVID test? Um, and if, if they have had a COVID test, that makes the management so much easier because if they've had a COVID test and it's negative, we just say, come down to the surgery and we'll examine you. If they have a COVID test and it's positive, it is a slightly different environment because we obviously want to, to prevent spread uh, and prevent risk and, and everything else. Um, so that, that is, a, is, is a big message that we need to get out there. If people still are developing symptoms, there's lots and lots of capacity uh, for testing to be done and people should be getting tested uh, as, as quickly as they possibly can. Um, the other point, uh, and just to pick up on the, the uh, mental health uh, query that you had, you, you, you're, you're, you're preaching to the converted on that. Uh, it, it, mental health, my, my fear in mental health is we call too much mental health. And what we have is we do have mental health, but we've also got social stress. Uh, and social stress, social stress has been exacerbated and it's been magnified uh, by the pandemic and, and the pressures that people have been under. The only way we solve that is in our communities and and in the in the you know the help of the the voluntary sector and so on. Uh, and it is about so much more than medical uh, help and medicalizing it in, on so many occasions. It is about. Uh, a vision for the future. It is about ambition. Uh, it is about uh, you know seeing where you 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 can go. It is about physical exercise. It is about keeping your own general health. Uh, you know and 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 preventing all of the other physical problems that can happen whenever your mental health is is affected. Uh, you know I I I'm such a big believer in in that being delivered in in the communities and having a real strong community presence and community voice on that. Uh, I think that's where we have to go and where we have to support. Sorry, Chair, you're on mute. Thank you. Thank you, Clark. Um, so I'm going then to Alan Chambers. Alan, go ahead, please. Can you hear me, Chairman? Yes, I can hear you okay, Alan. Go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Uh, uh, good morning, Dr. Stout. Uh, Dr. Stout, I, I absolutely concur with uh, your remarks about the GPs and their staff working harder than ever. We can certainly see that, and we appreciate uh, those efforts. Um, in terms of the, the new way that you're, you're seeing patients, um, you know, as a public rep, uh, occasionally get uh, the good news stories back from people, but more often than not, it's the disappointed stories that we hear. Um, and you did say in your opening remarks that there's been a positive feedback uh, in terms of uh, the, the patients and how they were measuring the new way of doing things. But uh, I'm just wondering how, how, how have you measured that uh, feedback uh, from, from patients? The other thing you mentioned was, um, and you explained why receptionists, and maybe over the years we've always thought receptionists were, were just been nosy, uh, and you have explained the, you know, the rationale behind that, and, and I accept that. But what about, uh, say, a, a, a male patient who wants to see or speak to a male doctor about maybe an intimate male issue, um, and the phone is answered by a female receptionist who starts to quiz him about why he wants to speak to a doctor. Is, is, is that an issue? Uh, and how do, you, how do you get around that? You've talked about the uh, pharmacists uh, working within practices. Um, are these, uh, is it in order that these uh, pharmacists, do they deal directly, speak directly with patients, or, or do they simply offer advice to the the, the GPs, because my experience of the pharmacists are that they, uh, they, they seem to be, one of their um, jobs seems to be to try and convince uh, patients to come off maybe a brand of particular medicine and go on their generic, uh, and you know, it seems to be a saving money exercise. 
Uh, and again, the pharmacists, uh, are they really empowered to discuss with patients that maybe the intimate nature of the, uh, the patient's uh, medical history? And uh, the other point is the, um, the, the prescription service at the moment that works very well. I, I have no problem with it, but uh, where you don't go to the surgery to collect the prescription, you go to a pharmacist, but you have to wait three or four days. But I think that that's adding to the perception that GP surgeries at the moment are a sort of a no-go zone. Um, can you see a situation where people will be able to call if they wish and collect a prescription, which they can go to a, a pharmacist and get it prescribed within an hour of, of, of receiving the prescription rather than having to wait three or four days? Thank you. Okay. Right. And there's there's an awful lot there. I'll, I'll maybe go backwards with that they, they, because your final point, um, I, I I would love to say absolutely no. If, if we go back to a point where people are having to just turn up to pick up a piece of paper, and this is what I was referring to with EPS, electronic prescribing, we need that now, and and that actually solves the time uh, problem as well. So I prescribe it in my surgery. In, in literally seconds, it is in the pharmacy. You've obviously got the, the whole practical uh, element of, of preparing it and checking it and, and so on and such like, but that, that solves your, your time problem as well. But it solves that nonsense of picking up pieces of paper and, and dragging them everywhere and losing them on buses and, and everything else. Um, so yeah, <laughs> I, I, my ambition would be that we don't go back to that. And, and I think we're probably taking a step backwards if, if we do, uh, we, we need to solve it more definitively. Um, again, just to, to follow on on the pharmacy and the pharmacists, your query on the pharmacists, um, I said from, from the outset, the role of the pharmacist in a practice is for safe and effective prescribing. Um, now, money always comes into that. I mean, money is, is constrained right across health. And if we can have efficient prescribing as well, uh, and that is about generics, and that needs to be a wider conversation too about what can you rationally and, and reasonably expect from a, from a national health service. So if you've got a generic medication that is costs pennies uh, or, a, or a branded uh, prescription that costs, uh, you know, a hundred times that, uh, does the NHS pick up that bill? Or if, if you're insisting on the fancy sugar-coated one, uh, you know, is, is that acceptable that, that, that the, the money is going to, towards that? So I think that is a, a bigger conversation. But uh, on, on pharmacists, they absolutely do speak to patients. Uh, they do a lot of medication reviews. Uh, they make sure that, that medication is monitored correctly. Uh, they make sure that people aren't on unsafe levels of, of medication. They provide a vital role in, in monitoring and reviewing mental health prescriptions in, in particular and making sure that uh, that, that is safe uh, and that various blood checks are done for people on, uh, on a lot of other medications. It will vary from practice to practice, but they, they have a, a really, really important role, uh, a really valuable role uh, that does free up uh, GP time as well. Um, your question on the male patient uh, and, uh, and uh, kind of sensitive area, um, what appears on my screen, and I suspect that's replicated elsewhere, is, uh, is personal. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, we, we don't expect people, we won't force people. I have to have to bear that in mind, doctor. <laughs> yeah. So, so it, is, it is perfectly acceptable to, for somebody to say it is a personal problem, and, uh, and I, would, I would prefer to just to, to speak directly to the, to the GP, so, and, and we will pick that up. That's, uh, we're, we're, we're not going to, to hold that against anybody. Um, and the final point, which was your first point, was, is in feedback. Um, so I'm slightly biased, I'm slightly skewed on this, and, and I think I've probably said it at the, uh, this committee before, that, that we've actually, are, my own practice has run this system for the last five or six years. Uh, if, I'm, if I'm being honest, it has taken us five or six years to get it right. We've constantly changed it and we've constantly adapted it. Uh, and we get very, very good feedback. We do still have a patient feedback group and a, a patient liaison group, uh, you know, so we're, we're constantly engaging our patients and, and what we're doing and, and what we're changing. Uh, so we do get very strong feedback on it. Um, there have been quite a number of surveys done uh, which have got feedback as well. Uh, and then also on feedback, uh, each individual doctor through their whole revalidation process has to get 
individual and personal feedback on the service that they're delivering. Uh, and so there is a, a real opportunity uh, you know, to provide that personal feedback. It won't be every single patient is asked for that, but it's a pretty significant number of patients uh, are asked for that. And, uh, and they certainly tell the truth. <laughs> and we certainly read them and, and take note of them. Thank you, Doctor. Okay, thank you, Alan and Arlea Flynn. Um, thank you, Chair and Alan. Thanks very much for all of your um, comments and answers so far. Um, so, just just on that point, then, Alan, around the, the the feedback, and and that is great that your surgery has that that patient feedback liaison group um, set up. I'm not sure if that's replicated. Um, how many surgeries you know carry out the same um, sort of provision? Um, but I do think that's important, and I'm just wondering. Obviously, a lot of today's discussion and. Carl had mentioned, as we know, it's, it, it has been covered in the media and stuff as well. And um, locally elected reps are picking up on on the issues and the pressures and like the human side to that, you know, that where people are sensing that feeling of of sort of dissatisfaction when um, in terms of having that access to their local GP services. And I'm just wondering from the perspective of um, from your own perspective and from the, across the, the broad GP um, federations, you know, are you picking up? Have you got a strong sense of um, that concern and that sense of, um, I suppose, dissatisfaction at the moment in terms of the past year um, throughout the pandemic and the lack of face to face contact? Okay, yeah. So, on the feedback group, just to, to begin with, um, you're right. I mean, that we find that very, very valuable in our own practice, and, and you're right, it's not. Clerk, I think we've lost Alan again there, have we? Yeah, he's, he's, he's frozen again there. We'll get him back on the call. Yeah. Well, thank you for bearing with us, Arlea. We uh, will hopefully get Alan Stout back here on the call now. No problem. I think you're back with us there now, Dr. Stout, so go, go right, let the hall go ahead again, please. We just lost you at the start of your answer. Okay, okay. Yeah, I was just uh, just saying the feedback group, it's, it isn't replicated in every single practice. It actually used to be contractual that everybody did have to do that, um, but but not anymore. Um, but I think that is something that we should revisit, and particularly as such a, a strong strategy at the moment is the co-production strategy uh, that we should be working with, with our patients. I think your second question, and I mean, of course, we get that feel, uh, and and it, you know, we are GPs. We we are there to help people. We, I mean, we are breaking our backs to help people, um, and it, it, I mean, it, it's frustrating. It, it, it's disappointing if if we are hearing that feedback. Um, but what we're also hearing uh, from practices is that they are are just stretched to the absolute limit. Um, and there is a feel within a, a significant number of practices that they're just not in the position to, to actually solve it. Uh, I, I put it on a, a tweet, actually, I think, uh, not that long ago, that, that you know, what, what it, if, if you've gone through a day and you've dealt with 300 contacts and you've broken your back to deal with those 300 contacts and you're 301st, uh, then complains and puts it on social media or whatever uh, that your GPs close and they're not doing anything and they can't do anything. I mean that that is 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 just so hard to to hear and so difficult to to hear. But I come back to capacity. Uh, you know the the solution for this. Uh, you know just has to be capacity. It's about building a really strong, sustainable primary care environment. Uh, it's not an overnight thing. It can't be achieved overnight. Uh, there's various things that can be achieved very, very quickly, and that is the wider teams. Um, but it, it, it's always going to be matching the capacity with the demand. And just to follow on from that, Alan, because I'm wondering, um, the in in terms of the the demand that's increasing, and then obviously the capacity reducing. Um, do you have any sort of um, updated statistics on the both those those kind of pressures because what I'm trying to work out is obviously because we've we've been picking up increased um, 
you know, complaints and disappointments within the the, the system. Um, and it's, it has been over the course of the past number of months in the past year. So I understand with the pandemic, what I'm trying to work out is, can we make the links? Is this down to just the demand and increasing and the capacity reducing? Or is there a link with, I think, what the chair was alluding to earlier, with maybe um, weaknesses within the phone first system? Do you know, so is it demand and capacity? Or is it that the, the, this triage, this phone first system and the reduction in face to face contact is actually what may be creating some of these problems at the minute? Oh, it's much wider than that. Uh, I mean, the, the, the phone first actually makes us even more accessible. And that's why the, the number of contacts is going up, because we're just dealing with so many more contacts. People phone it. And, uh, but, it, but I mean, even take, even take vaccination as an example. General practice is a repository for absolutely everything. So uh, with, with every alert or every scare or every guideline that comes out, the first point of contact is general practice. So let me give you a couple of examples. I mean, we're desperately trying a couple of questions so far, quite rightly, have been about cancer and delayed diagnosis with cancer. But yet we're moving now in, into an era where we're opening up society and people are thinking about going on holidays. And, and to go on holiday, you're going to need evidence of vaccination, not a vaccine passport, but evidence of vaccination. Where in the world do you think people are going to go for their evidence of vaccination? It doesn't matter where they've got it. If they've got it in the SSE or they've got it in the hospital or, or if they've got it through us, they will phone us to ask for evidence of vaccination. Uh, the chair mentioned earlier the success of the program, a million plus people. We're going to get a million plus contacts looking for evidence of vaccination. What's that going to do to our phone lines? Again, we get the worries and the change in the guidance about AstraZeneca and the headaches post AstraZeneca. Doesn't matter where you got your AstraZeneca vaccine. If you're a little bit concerned either before you get it or after you get it, who are you going to phone? You're going to phone your GP. Again, you know, when we move into the younger age group where we know there is more vaccine hesitancy, if we really want to target them, who's going to do that targeting? Who are they going to phone if they're a little bit concerned? It's going to be their GP. And every single one, I mean, the vaccination is a tiny part of what we do, um, but every single one of those generates more and more and more phone calls. And so hence, it is no surprise whatsoever uh, that it is difficult to get through on the phone uh, and that the, the capacity is limited. Uh, and, and I mean, that can be replicated right across anything else uh, that, that appears in the news, appears as a, a scare, appears as a, a guideline or, or anything else. Uh, you know, the first point of contact is your, your local GP. Uh, and we really feel that and, and we, uh, we just get inundated. And that's where it becomes, uh, and I will use the impossible word, it becomes impossible to manage. Mm -hmm. No, that, that's fair enough. Um, Alan, thanks very much for that. And just finally then, um, you had mentioned earlier on that so that, that you don't expect um, surgeries will return um, to the 100% face-to-face contact. So I was hoping maybe, I don't know if you're able to at the moment, but could you elaborate a wee bit more on that? So if we're, if we're not going back to 100% face-to-face, you know, um, I, what planning or preparation is happening now for what capacity the surgeries are going to be expected to meet and even on that system around when you're talking about that how important that phone system is um given that the surgeries won't be operating at 100 percent capacity is there any planning or preparation that is happening now to try and enhance the capacity for the phone first system because that is going to be so so important yeah, so, so practices at the moment are operating at 150% capacity. They're, they're op operating at a capacity way beyond what, uh, what they, can, they can deal with. Um, and and the, the, the phone first actually enables them within that tsunami of demand to make sure that they are able to see the people face-to-face -face that need to be seen. So that's what I mean uh, whenever that is, is going to continue because that provides a safe and an effective uh, service uh, going forward. And we know, uh, the, I mean, the evidence quite clearly shows that an awful lot of, of things can be dealt with either over the phone or by photograph or by video consultation or whatever. And a vast uh, number of people actually quite like that. So if you are working, you know, and you find it difficult to, to get down, uh, you, you are working. But again, don't forget, 
uh, you know, and, and and this is where I don't like the kind of return to normal. I don't think we should anything should return to normal. I think the minister was was very clever talking about a rebuilding uh, as opposed to a restart because uh, the face to face the old system was far from perfect as well, uh, and we had just as many complaints about the old system because it was still difficult to get through on the phone to book an appointment, and when you could get through on the phone to book an appointment, we were getting complaints that the appointment could be two, three, four weeks away. Uh, you know, and so on and such like. Um, so what we've got to do is take the best of both. We've got to make sure that we've got the best possible access. We've got to make sure that we have a system that enables us to see the people that need to be seen uh, at an appropriate time in an appropriate manner. Um, and that then needs to be supported. And what I'm hoping that we're, we're doing today is, uh, is hopefully that I'm explaining uh, what are the benefits of this uh, and, and hopefully garnering your own support uh, to say this is actually the right way uh, to, to move forward, but, but we all need to be collectively supporting it uh, and, and promoting it. That's great. Thanks very much, Alan. Thanks, Carol or, or Leah. To Bruno, thanks, or Leah. I'll go on then to Jerry Carroll. Lana, I wish your guest. Jerry, the hall. Um, thanks, Alan. Um, just a, a quick question, kind of following up um, on something I raised with you before and, and Carl raised around the access to NHS counselling services. Uh, I know the MDTs are the preferred model, but I'm concerned that it's going to be at least another five years before they're, they're fully ruled, uh, rolled out. Um, and also I'm concerned that you know people are being told uh, to go to community services, which uh, I suppose people don't really care where they go so long as they get the services and community services may be the best, but uh, those services, as we heard, are, are under pressure and, and strain and, and not getting the, the appropriate funding. So I'm very, very concerned about that. Um, I'm also very concerned about, you know, in my own constituency in West and maybe North as well, but certainly in West Belfast, 50% of, of GPs uh, don't have access to um, in-house um, council services or the public, the population don't have access to those services. Um, so, so I'm very, very concerned about that. And, and, I, and I'm, I'm concerned that people are kind of told that, you know, the, the, the perfect scenario or, or, of where people should go is kind of presented and that's fair enough to do. But in the meantime, you know, these areas have the highest levels of mental health uh, pressure, stress, illness and all these things. Um, so that's just a, a concern that you, you hopefully can speak to. And just a final question sort of following up on that. Um, the mental health workers who will be um, either working in or already are under the kind of the, the control of the uh, MDTs, are they employed by the trusts or the federations or, or what's the status um, of those uh, workers either now or um, as they expand and develop? Thanks, Alan. Okay, uh, again, I'll, I'll pick up on the last point first, just because that's the way my mind works, my brain works. Um, it, it can be a mixture. Uh, I mean, some will be employed by the trust, some will be employed by by federations if need be. Um, but but equally, there's nothing to stop an engagement with a, a local community provider and, and them being the employer as well. It's, it's, uh, you know, I'm not precious in any make, shape or form as to who employs people. I think it's about the service on the ground and, and, and that it is there, it's functioning and it's delivering. Um, so so I don't think that should ever be a, a, a stumbling block. Uh, and I think we should we should look at, at all options, whatever, whatever is uh, is the best way to, to deliver it. Um, I agree with you on the uh, on the counselling and you know I agree with you um, because I've, I've said it already. Um, and again, the north and west. When you take when you take those two areas, we know. And and it, this is this is such a frustration as well. We're twenty twenty one, and we know we have health inequalities, and we've got roughly the same health inequalities that we've had for the last twenty or thirty years, and we struggle to deal with them. And we need to move to a population health model that is looking at the needs of a local population and targeting those needs. Uh, and if mental health as you quite rightly say is is a big issue in north and west we target that uh, and and that that should just be simple common sense and we make sure that there is more resource and more staff there uh, than there is in other areas that it's not maybe not quite <coughs> excuse me it's such a problem in um, and that's where we have to have a more reactive service. Um, it's you know we do we do things sometimes just because 
you know, that is the strategy or that is the way that we do it. We've, we've got to understand what the local need is uh, and react and address that. Uh, and that's the only way we're, we're going to ever, ever change that. Um, you know, and it, it, it's it's about more, I said it earlier, it's about more than just providing the mental health services. It is about that social support. It is about diet and education and exercise and and uh, and job opportunities and, and everything else that uh, that comes with that. Um, but that has to be done with local populations and, and in response to, to local needs. And really just finally just add in there, addressing poverty and deprivation is probably a key issue because that's the reason why people are uh, facing these uh, health inequalities and it hasn't been addressed. But thanks. Thanks, Alan. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Jerry. And finally, then this morning in, in this session, I'm going to Chiara Hunter. Uh, Chiara Gorey, let it hold. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Dr. Stout, uh, for being here. Other members have touched on a number of things I was interested on around uh, the workforce and things like that, as I do know a significant number of GPs are set to retire, unfortunately, over the next few years. I just have one final question, <clears throat> which surrounds mental health as well and supporting vulnerable individuals. Um, oftentimes what we see is homeless people who are struggling with addiction uh, often uh, if they're staying in hostels can change their postcode week to week uh, and can often be far from their GP which can present a number of difficulties with access to medication and referrals. Um, I had a constituent as recent as last night um, who was told his Belfast uh, based GP uh, wouldn't make a referral for the crisis team in Causeway uh, because the, the patient was now based within the north coast uh, and this would be an issue as the patient was between two trusts but they can't they, they couldn't help that matter um but basically this individual was acutely suicidal uh, and was forced to go to a and e to wait up to seven hours to be told to come back in the morning so uh, i'm just wondering uh, you know for vulnerable vulnerable individuals like this uh, is this something you come across often and in emergency situations like this where geography maybe ha is having a negative impact on getting a referral uh, what steps can be taken to make things more efficient and streamlined if a gp uh, referral is needed. Yeah, so I mean, that, that is an example that we do come across, and, and not solely for, for mental health reasons, for, for a number of other reasons, uh, and if a patient is out of area. And it clouds the, it, it clouds the answer slightly because um, it doesn't have to be just a, a, a you know, somebody from Belfast being in the Northwest, for for example, you know, where you're saying, well, it's kind of the same system. It can equally apply to somebody coming over from Scotland, England, Wales, or, or from, uh, you know, from, from the Republic. So, you know, it, it, it does, it, it does happen. There is something within the GP contract called uh, immediately necessary treatment. So if, if I'm sitting in my practice and somebody's in crisis in my area right outside, and they happen to have come down from Port Rush, uh, we have a, an obligation, we have a professional duty to provide immediately necessary treatment uh, to, to that patient. Um, and that is a given. Um, and, and, and it does happen. It, it happens all the time. We, and, and we would get called uh, all the time uh, on that. So it, it, again, it shouldn't, uh, it shouldn't be a barrier, um, you know, to, to accessing that, uh, that treatment. And, uh, and I mean, that case that you describe is one that uh, most likely would end up as a as a GP assessment of the mental health status and of what would be required from from that point onwards. Um, so it is important that, uh, that that a GP is involved. Thank you. Yeah, it's just something I noted. You know, it seems to be kind of vulnerable individuals who who have no choice but to move between hostels, kind of fall between those gaps. And certainly with things like mental health, getting regular access to that crucial medication, um, mood stabilizers, things like that seem to be an issue. But no, thank you very much for clearing that up. That's helpful. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Dr. Stout, for engaging with the committee this morning. And I certainly uh, I certainly feel that, that uh, we're very acutely aware, as I said in, in the opening remarks, that, that uh, GPs are under massive pressure along with every other person who's, who's working in our health system and that uh, we absolutely, as a committee, I think want to see everything that can be done in terms of messaging and in terms of delivery of service to, to provide them with that support, including, and I think it's been touched on appropriately, their own, their own mental health. But we are also very, very keen to see a system in place whereby people are getting the services 
that they that they need so badly. In what what we all acknowledge is a very very stretched system, and I think I think the uh, and and you and I have you and I have spoken regularly around the whole issue of workforce, the aging workforce, the fact that younger people coming into the workforce want different things in terms of their practice, and that I think is to be welcomed as well in terms of. Um, addressing burnout and and the retention of staff that staff are happy with a, that they're doing a range of work in a way that they that they want to deliver their medical care to to the people who need it so i think that is all all hugely significant um and i i want to wish each and every member who you represent out there all the very best in the time ahead and and they certainly have our regard and our best wishes but i do think there may be some merit in terms of looking at how you could be further supported in terms of the rollout of the MDTs, but also, and I think significantly, the pressure is being applied, the additional pressure is being applied as a, as a result of the vaccination programme. So thank you very much, and please bring uh, every best wish to, to those you represent, Dr. Stout, and thank you for coming to committee this morning. Okay, thank you, Chair, and thanks for your time this morning. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, Okay, members, I think that was a very uh, a very worthwhile session, I have to say. Would members be content to be right to the department and ask for a review in terms of the pressure, the additional pressure that's coming from the vaccination system and how that maybe could be supported to, to take some pressure off the GPs? I think it's clear that GPs are struggling and it's also clear that people are struggling to get access to the GPs. So nobody's a winner here. So we have to try to see what can be done in the short, medium and long term but in the short term, I'm very conscious of the additional pressure of the vaccination programme. Would members be content to ask for an urgent review of that? Paula? Um, yeah, absolutely content, Chair. But I would also, if, if we're writing a letter, can we include um, a request for an update on the um, CPS regarding the um, pharmacy, or sorry, the um, prescriptions for medicines? I think that was something that um, Dr. Stout raised there in terms of the delay, even though it's something that the Department of Health have indicated they're very supportive of. So just an update. Thank you. Yeah, so that's on the electronic prescribing system. Um, members content with that addition? Yeah. Pam, were you looking in there? Yes, Chair, just to agree with uh, what you've said. So um, call up on the electronic prescribing as well. And I think um, it should be also be asking a question on the round uh, workforce opinion, whether those will continue or, or be in order to try and come up um, services and help for GP purposes. And I think you're right as well in terms of the vaccine rollout as well. Um, I think we can't afford to just simply say, well, GPs look after that, but it's going to be a massive operation going forward into the future in terms of uh, vaccine boosts. Uh, so I think we should be asking yeah. More around that workforce appeal, making sure that we're harnessing every single piece of help that, that we can um, for the health service in general. Going forward. Yeah. Thank you, Pam. Your sound is poor, but we did catch, we did get, we did get, we were able to follow it. Alan, your hands up there. Sure. Just in, in relation to GPs carrying out the vaccinations, uh, my understanding is that the, the practices, it does attract additional funding. Uh, to the practices, uh, and I'm just wondering, are, are GPs uh, objecting to doing it, or are they actually keen uh, to participate in the, uh, the vaccination program because of the additional funding that it can attract to the practices? So, you know, do, is that what they do? The GPs want us uh, to campaign uh, to have that uh, service removed from them. Or, or are they keen to continue to do it? Well, I think I think uh, Dr. Stout acknowledged that they are under tremendous pressure and they do recognise that this is having an impact on their ability. That, that can form part of the review, um, but I think it is valid that we look to see, is there a way? We are still dealing with COVID-19. We are going to have to look at at least 50% of the massive effort there's been in the autumn months when we would, when we could be looking at at flu, for example, we could be looking at for the COVID. So I think it's valid that it's, the question is asked, um, and I, I, I guess I guess there may be very variations of opinions within GPs, but I think I, I, it's very clear that a lot of people are struggling to access the services. So we have to take that into account. Yeah. Um, okay. Anyone else want anyone else want anything in on that, or are members content then? 
Okay, members are content. So listen, members, I'll take a very short break there and we'll come back at 10 past 11, please. So return at 11.10. Clark, can you take us out of broadcasting, please? Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly. Just waiting for an authorization chair. Where am I have it? That's a slide now, chair. Okay. Okay, members, thank you. Uh, so we're going to resume now with our second uh, briefing session this morning. And this is in relation to the Health and Social Care Bill. So this is a, an oral evidence session on the Health and Social Care Bill. At tab 6.1, there's a clerk's memo providing a story of the written responses copies of the responses from the Royal College of GPs, the Royal College of Nurses, and the Chartered Society of Physiotherapists are at tabs 6.2 to 6.4. So I would now like to welcome to our meeting this morning in relation to the Health and Social Care Bill, Dr. Lawrence Dorman, who is chairperson of the Royal College of General Practitioners here in the North. Are you able to hear us there, Dr. Dorman? Yes, I am, Chair, thank you. Thank you very much, and you're very welcome this morning. Um, we also are joined by Ms. Rita Devlin, and Rita is the Associate Director of Nursing Policy and Practice in the Royal College of Nursing. Good morning, Rita. Are you able to hear us okay? I am. Thank you, Colm. Thank you. And also Mr. Tom Sullivan. And Tom is the Public Affairs and Policy Manager with the Chartered Society of Physiotherapy here in the North. Are you able to hear us okay, Tom? I am, Chair. Thank you. Okay. Well, listen, thank you all very much, and you're all very welcome to Fault Your Row of a Leg, Koji and, uh, Koji and, and Krinu, or Majin Shaw. You're all very welcome to our meeting this morning. None of you are strangers, I don't think, to the committee or to individual members of the committee. We've all met on very many occasions around very many of the issues that we all uh, share in common and have a common interest in. So, um, I'm, I'm, I'm very glad to have you along the committee this morning to assist the committee in terms of our consideration of the health and social care bill. So given, given the, uh, the time limits which we unfortunately always are, are operating under, could I ask each of you to maybe give a three or four minute briefing or opening statement to the, to the, to the meeting shorter than that if, if, if that's possible, but, but, uh, but um, just to get a balance of views from each of you uh, so along the lines of what your organisation current role uh, and and we'll then go to members' questions and see if we can uh, if we can make the best use of the time. So I'll go back to the order that I started uh, my introductions in. I'll go back to you, Dr. Dorman. Would you like to go ahead and start and then maybe go to Rita and then to Tom? Thank you. Yes, please. So thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thank you very much, committee members, to invite you to the session this morning. The Royal College of GPs is a professional body for the general practice, and we have 1,400 members across Northern Ireland. Uh, if you permit me, Chair, can I just very briefly make some broad comments just in general practice access, following on from my doctor, from my colleague, Dr. Alan Stout. Uh, just let me place it on the record very clearly. I mean, our practices are open. We are here for our patients and we're working ever harder than ever. Uh, we heard lots of examples of our patients, you know, who are finding it difficult to get access. But please just let me give a quick example of one of my GP colleagues who works west of the ban. Uh, this GP colleague is working very hard and on one day last month she had a patient contact her surgery. She gave her that morning a telephone consultation and at the end of the telephone consultation brought her into the surgery that afternoon for a face-to-face -face appointment. At the end of that face-to-face -face appointment, she gave her a prescription, and as the patient stood up and turned to her GP and said, thank you, doctor, now tell me, when are you opening again? <laughs> I just want to make the, the committee aware, this is so hurtful and demoralizing to our workforce. We are working harder than ever before, but, but we know that but in cases, patients are just not getting the service that they deserve. This isn't acceptable. We want to provide that care and service that they deserve, but we do need support for it. So just like a hospital theatre can only perform so many operations, in the morning, a GP can physically only see or speak to so many patients, and we really, really want to 
do the job well. I mean, Alan has outlined just some of the challenges that we've been doing and what we've been dealing under. Administering the vaccine has been a huge one. Uh, today, we have GPs have administered 676,000 doses of vaccines, but these have been the really difficult ones to do because we've done it from the initial JCVI uh, mandatory criteria, and these are really slow to do because it takes us to interrogate our, our data. Actually administering a vaccine, the actual jabbing of a patient in the arm is a really straightforward, easy task, so it is, but you need GPs to be able to look at our data so that we can identify the ones that need to go first, while dealing that with, with a very slow and bumpy vaccine supply. Our, our skills and, and relationship with our patient have also been paramount in this, and time and again, I've had to reassure patients that the vaccine is safe, and it's been good enough for me that I've received a personally, my family have received it personally, and that if it's good enough for me and my family, it's good enough for you. We are seeing a tsunami of mental health issues. We're dealing with the challenges of, of, of elective care uh, reform in hospitals and so on, but we're still open and, and keen to, to, to treat our patients. So we know that your, our patients and your constituents value general practice. It's why, why they've contacted you in the first place, and we're passionate about us. So we're really keen to work out with the, uh, work with you and, and support our patients. So thank you, Chair, just for that. To turn to the Health and Social Care Bill, We've submitted our formal response, uh, so I won't go through a lot of it, but can I just please allow me to, to pay tribute to the considerable work over the years by all the staff in intermediate care in the Health and Social Care Board, particularly Dr. Sloan Harper and Dr. Margaret O'Brien, and all the dedicated staff and practice support offices right across the region who work slow, closely and helpfully with our practices. The, the bill itself is relatively under controversial, but there's just three aspects I would just like to highlight. Uh, the first bit is that this bill will transfer our contracts into the Department of Health and we welcome anything that, that reduces bureaucracy and anything that will continue the ongoing support for our practices. The second bit is that we're keen that the general practice board clearly heard in commissioning structures, which are clearly outcomes and have clear structures to deal with requests in a robust and timely fashion and where appeal, appeals can be heard in a timely fashion too. So new ways of working are already started in, in the region. I mean, we've got MDTs which feature first contact therapy, which my colleague Tom, you know, can address and so on, but we badly need, you know, the GP voice to be able to be heard. And, uh, and again, we're hearing before and again about the mental health needs from our communities. Uh, there's a huge response. The third point I'd like to advise about is the huge responsibility for safeguarding training. Now, at the moment, uh, we're very very much supportive of the responsibility of this passing on to the health and social care trusts, but there still needs to be a clarity along the lines of responsibility of management of training and safeguarding a primary care level. GPs have a massive, massive responsible job when it's safeguarding children or adults, uh, and we're seeing this with new legislation coming out with conversive control and so on. GPs need to have that training uh, to be able to play our full role with this. So thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm very happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Lawrence, and I'll go to read. I will take the three submissions, and then members can address their questions to to the most relevant or, or the most relevant of you can pick up on the question. So I'll go there to Rita. Uh, go ahead, Rita, please. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, just to let you know, the Royal College of Nursing is a trade union and professional organisation, and we represent nurses, nursing assistants, and student nurses across all practice settings in Northern Ireland. Um, we have previously submitted. So I'm just going to really make the key points. We do accept that the purpose of the bill is to allow for the dissolution of the Health and Social Care Board. And we accept that the clauses of the bill as currently drafted appropriate reflect appropriately reflect and articulate this intent. Um, so in that respect, we've no specific comments on the drafting of the legislation. We are broadly supportive of the purpose of the Health and Social Care Bill, but we have raised a number of issues relating to wider policy issues and the implications underpinning the draft legislation. We note um, the previous discussions in the committee and we share many of the concerns raised by the committee um, and other MLAs, in particular your own um, statement, Chair, that there's little point in reorganising the deck chairs. The transformation of healthcare structures must result in simple and clear lines of responsibility and accountability. Um, Part of the ethos behind the original establishment of the Health and Social Care Board was the need to depoliticise the day-to-day -day management of the service, and that was to leave the Department of Health then to concentrate on strategy and policy. Whilst we accept that these arrangements have not been successful, it does not necessarily follow that returning the functions of the board to the department will automatically improve manners in the, matters in this respect. And we are not convinced that this move will result in better outcomes for patients and the public. 
It's also important to remember that the functions of the board embrace three areas, commissioning, performance management and financial management. Much of the focus to date has been understandably the implications for commissioning um, and the, of the de decision to abolish the, the board and the local commissioning groups. However, we know that commissioning is only one element and we wonder whether the, functions, uh, the other two functions will take place. Will this be by the Department of Health? And if so, could this be a case of the department marking its own homework? Um, we note that under the bill, the Employment of Health and Social Care Board staff will transfer to the HSC business organisation, business service organisation, under their existing terms and conditions. But staff will be operationally accountable to the Department of Health to which the functions of the board will transfer. So we're not clear about the rationale for the decision and neither the bill itself nor the various debates and discussions um, have clarified this matter for us. The phenomenon of staff being line managed within, within one organisation whilst their professional accountability resides in a different organisation appears to be a recipe for confusion. This issue is referenced but not fully explained or elaborated upon in the Health and Social Care Board Ambition People Strategy 2021 to 2022. We note the extensive discussions have taken place at this committee on the implications of the bill for future commissioning arrangements, particularly in relation to how the local dimension will be accommodated and by extension, how a genuine focus on tackling health, equalities, uh, health inequalities amongst Northern Ireland can be sustained. In response, officials stated that local commissioning groups will be embedded within the Department of Health and will continue to address these issues. Officials have also referenced the new integrated care approach that is designed to replace the existing arrangements. The RCN would share the committee's desire to see greater clarity as to how these prior priorities and associated activities will be discharged. Um, we also need to know what assurances the Department for Health can provide that the new arrangements will be more effectively, can more effectively deliver the commissioning of health and social care services on the basis of assessed need across Northern Ireland. So just in conclusion, we, we do support the intended purpose of the bill and we are content that the drafting of the legislation gives effect to the purpose. However, as I've said, we have some concerns about the extent to which the proposed arrangements will actually create a more streamlined process, the relevance to the broader pr process of health and care transformation, the impact of the change upon accountabilities and responsibilities of the board staff, and the capacity of the new arrangement to be a appropriate responsive to the profound health and social care inequalities that persist in Northern Ireland. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Rita. And I'll go then across to yourself, Tom. Um, go ahead, please, and, and give us your briefing. Thank you, Chair. Um, I would like to thank you and the committee um, for the opportunity to present here today. And I would also like to thank the committee staff for their assistance. As you know, I represent the Chartered Society of Physiotherapy, which is the professional body and trade union for physiotherapists. Our members work in a variety of settings across health and social care in the community and in private practice. Physiotherapy is one of the allied health professions, which along with 12 other professions, account for the second largest group of healthcare professionals within the health service. The CSP is committed to a health service that is free at the point of delivery, based on need, publicly funded, publicly provided, and publicly accountable. It is vitally important that there is full consultation and scrutiny on this very important issue regarding the dissolution of the Health and Social Care Board the abolition of local commissioning groups, um, the development of a new model for commissioning health and social care services and amendments consequential on the transfer of those functions. As we stated in our submission to the Health Committee, the CSP is not opposed to the dissolution of the Health and Social Care Board per se or the transfer of its functions. What we are concerned about is the abolition of the local commissioning groups the transfer of their functions to the Department of Health, the fundamental impact this will have on the commissioning, and the lack of detail regarding how the commissioning process will operate in the future. With the transfer of functions to the Department of Health, we need to see the publication of a governance framework for the oversight of health service commissioning in Northern Ireland. 
which should define how commission, the commissioning process will operate within the department's current structures, its leadership, its membership, its relationship to the wider, wider health and social care system. It should be clear within the governance framework how the commissioning process will operate, how decisions will be made, including managing the conflicts of interest, and how it will engage with stakeholders and exercise financial control and risk management. The CSP agrees that the operation of future commissioning arrangements should be redesigned and must promote greater involvement of frontline health and social care professionals in decision making, decision making and service development and should take account of the crucial role of the community and voluntary sector in driving change and innovation. The CSP is concerned that the knowledge and expertise and diversity of views on the local commissioning groups will be lost with the transfer functions to the Department of Health. The CSP is further concerned that the structures within the Department of Health will not facilitate the inclusion of all represented clinical groups in the commissioning process, given the structural inequalities which currently exist. Following the publication of the Donaldson Report and a review of commissioning by the Department of Health in 2015, responses consistently emphasised the need to simplify the current commissioning process, make it more transparent and ensure greater involvement from clinical and professional staff as well as service users. The CSP believes the commissioning process should adopt a whole systems approach, which acknowledges the interdependencies between citizens, communities, organizations, and services. Commissioning should be a catalyst for embedding democracy at every stage, not just setting the strategic direction, but rebalancing the contribution from public services, communities, and citizens to improve outcomes. It should not be about delivering more of the same for less. The future commissioning model should demonstrate that it will create the conditions to provide opportunities to change where the power lies between commissioners, providers, providers, service users and the community. Future commissioning decisions will be critical to rebuilding services post-COVID. Therefore, joint commissioning, fostering innovative systems thinking, co-production and co-design with service users are key to finding greater efficiencies and better productivity. In the Delivering Together strategy states that in the way we operate, we have the opportunity to promote a new way of working with the community and voluntary sectors through the innovative, innovative use of social procurement clauses and commissioning services based on social value rather than simply on the basis of lowest, lowest cost. In conclusion, this ambition needs to be embedded in any future commissioning model if it is to be successful and deliver the services that patients need. It is the CSP's contention that at present there is insufficient detail regarding the future commissioning process and its ability to deliver what is required. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you and thank you all for those and those are, are I have to say, very, very interesting and very, very clear presentations and very useful to committee in that in that regard. So thank you very much for that. Um, I suppose my my first question to each of you is, is a fairly quick question, but just it's it's kind of picking up on that co-production idea. But what is your organization's current role within the commission process? So at this point in time, what role does each of you play in relation to the current commissioning process? So I'll go back to you, Lawrence, sir. Yeah, no problem. So, so, so GPs have have had good representation on local commissioning groups, LCGs, previously. Uh, we've had significant representation on it, and it's and it's we, we've supported them well. But it's it's vital that the GP voice is included in whatever new structure comes forward, so that we can bring our insight into population health need. Uh, and that's going to be different for me as a GP in Kilkeel compared to maybe a GP in Belfast. And it's vital that those sort of local issues are are, are taken into. A, you know, into consideration. I mean, as well as that, I mean, at a time of change in the health service, well, multidisciplinary team development and integration with the community and the third sector services are, are going to be so important as we move forward. We, we really support, you know, that, that the GP voice and the, and the practice voice is, is heard in all of this. Thank you, Lawrence. And Rita, um, your um, current involvement in, in the system? Yes, Colin, we wouldn't have a current involvement in the local commissioning groups outside of what our our own members would as part of their day-to-day -day roles. So as an organization, we don't input into the local commissioning groups. Thank you. And Tom? Um, likewise, um, 
uh, column, the CSP would not have a presence within the local commission groups. However, there would be uh, AHP consultants um, from a variety of AHP backgrounds from the PHA who would sit on those commissioning groups and who would be in contact and have regular conversations with the heads of service of the various allied health professions across all of the trusts. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and, and I do and I do recognise and actually I do welcome the input this morning in the context of, you know, looking at this not simply as a functional or technical piece of work whereby you transfer, but if we are looking to genuinely rebuild, if we're looking to transform, this is a key a staging post in that journey and therefore we should be ambitious in terms of how we can make this the best that it can be in terms of the co-production in terms of the local involvement in terms of and, and i think that social procurement and social value are hugely relevant uh, concepts in relation to all of this um, there are there is much of value beyond just strict economic value or downward auctions in terms of, of value so i think i think we all agree that there is a potential here to do more and do better. I had made a point at a previous meeting that you wouldn't want to move out of your old house before you'd seen the new place. And I think that's that's important that we do see. And I'm, I'm particularly re interested in, in a couple of the points that you raised there, Rita, around the, the elements of not only commissioning, but performance and financial, um, those particular elements. And do you have suggestions or can you uh, expand a bit on those concerns or maybe some of the potential solutions that you would consider possible on that radar? Well, well, I suppose our, our main concern was there didn't seem to have been any um, um, attention paid to those two other functions. So, for example, performance management is about, for me, um, performance management should be about outcomes for patients. Um, and making sure that whatever we do in Northern Ireland as part of the, the health and, you know, the health service, um, everything should be focused on improving outcomes for patients. So the performance management function hasn't really been identified within the bill. Um, what we would want to see, obviously, is outcomes based um, performance management. There's no point in keeping doing the same things if they don't work. Um, so we would very much want um, assurance that if, if, for example, a service is commissioned um, and we find that the service doesn't improve outcomes for patients, then that service should not be commissioned again. Um, so I think the performance management function is very important in terms of the whole idea of um, being accountable and responsible for, the, you know, the, the, the health budget is huge in Northern Ireland, but I'm not always convinced that we look at um, value for money in terms of outcomes for patients. And we tend to keep doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different outcomes. And so therefore, performance management is about identifying what works and what doesn't. And we, I think we would want real clarity around that function that, that is being transferred over as well. And that's why we sort of said there could be an element of the department marking their own homework um, because if you are both the commissioner and the performance manager then you know there, there, there's there's a lack there of maybe independent scrutiny or independent thought around what works and what doesn't yeah thank you and, and actually that cross cuts with uh, with some of our previous discussions around inequalities and and again the uh, the lack of data and hard evidence as to what is working and therefore what's not working and therefore what you can do better. So I do think that's that's a, a key uh, difficulty, but also a key opportunity. And I think that's where we're looking at here. There is obviously change taking place. How do we maximise the opportunity within that? And I mean, in terms of the in terms of the performance again, as well as individual outcomes, and those are crucial. I think. We need to also have a consideration for community outcomes and for equity across all parts of the north as well. And that is, again, something that, that I think should be considered as we look at the, at the bill and look at any other legislation that could or, or policy that could uh, drive that change forward. OK, thank you. That's, that's very, very useful. Um, yeah, go ahead, Tom. Yeah. Yeah, just to add to that, sure, in terms of we, to a certain extent, we know what has worked well to date. And Lawrence um, um, referenced it um, in his presentation, um, and, and that is in, in terms of the multidisciplinary teams in primary care, and the first contact physio has been hugely successful. 
so that is a, a really good example and, and you know of collaborative multidisciplinary working which delivers what patients need the caveat to that is that um the biggest restriction that we're going to face in terms of commissioning isn't necessarily about money it's going to be about workforce and having the the workforce with the requisite skills to be able to expand that further and to roll that out across all of the trusts in Northern Ireland. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Tom. Okay, I'm going to go across to members then. So I'm going, at this point, I have a, in front of me a Deputy Chair Pam Cameron, then Paula Bradshaw, Karen Lee Killen, and Arlea Flynn. So I'll go back to yourself there. Uh, Pam, go ahead, please. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Lawrence, Sweda, and Tom, for your attendance at committee uh, this morning. My first question is for, for Lawrence. Um, and Lawrence, I just want to say thank you for uh, the clarity around and reminding us actually that there's a lot more than just sticking that job on the arm. There's all, all the work that has gone on, especially from the GP side of things, when you were identifying the people who were absolutely the most vulnerable, who needed the vaccine first. So I think it's good to be reminded of that. So thank you, thank you for the good work you're doing. Um, I think from the from the Royal College of GP point of view, can you tell us a bit more about the the current confusion around the the chain of command for training and support for safeguarding in primary care? And um, could you also tell us? Um, how the bill could be strengthened to enhance accountability um, when the transfer of these functions relating to children and social care takes place? Yeah, no problem. So, so in, uh, areas that specifically regarding to you know social care and children, the transfer of the responsibility to the health and social care trust. I mean, we recognise that as appropriate and so on, but but there needs to be clarity about the lines of responsibility and the management of in training and safeguarding at primary care level. So all GPs will tell you they are lifelong learners. I mean, this is a skill that we need to keep doing. We need to keep updating because things keep changing, such as digital risks and so on like that. Uh, and the establishment of the safeguarding safeguarding board for Northern Ireland has, has been better, but there's still confusion about the representation of GPs, primary care physicians, and the responsibility of who oversees that training and how do we get support for it. Uh, so I think that's an important part of the bill, an important part of our jobs. Uh, we have huge responsibilities to both childhood protection and adult safeguarding protection. I mean, they're quite different areas, but but the things that we witness on that and, and in our jobs and our daily lives how we get that training and how that training is delivered in a robust way with, with clear governance and clear lines of responsibility, I think is really important. Thank you for that. And uh, Chair, just a more general question for wh whoever um, to ask what benefits um, a governance framework for commissioning services bring? I, um, I think from from my perspective, from um, CSP's perspective, um, we need to see a governance framework in relation to how that new commissioning process is going to operate and what the professional oversight is going to be in terms of those commissioning decisions. And I think it's, it's right and proper that you would have those governance uh, structures in place in whatever new model um, is, is going to be taken forward. Okay. Again, I kind okay, of the day. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. One, one final question there, then, um, and around, yeah, you know, it's obvious, you know, is it unprecedented for for staff to be employed by one body, i.e., BSO, but operate under the authority of another? And uh, do you foresee problems arising from this? And and is there anything more we can do to ensure that the rights of employees are, are protected? Um, I, I'm not sure. I mean, I'm, it's not clear why that decision has been made um, to have two bodies um, with two different functions for the same group of staff. And obviously, I mean, it is a recipe for confusion because you you can't, I don't believe you can answer two masters. So it is very important that people understand where their professional accountability is, if they're professional staff, but also just general day-to-day -day line management and, and, and the issues that um, line one group line managing a group of staff and the other group having um, 
I suppose, pulled and on their on their time. It it just doesn't seem to be a sensible way of moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, thank you, Pat. And, and actually, I, uh, that that does uh, actually remind me that I should probably I should declare my own interest in terms of having been previously a social worker and on a career break with one of the trusts. And actually, I do recognise the dilemma there, Rita, and have to say because you do have your professional code of ethics and your responsibility to the people for whom you're working. But you also have then a, an employer responsibility, and there can be a contradiction and a conflict in terms of, of both of those, and that is something that does need to be uh, considered uh, at all times. Okay, thank you for that. I will go then across to Paula Bradshaw. Paula, go ahead, please. Um, thank you, Chair, and thank you, panel, for your contributions, both written and oral, this morning. I just have one question, actually, that's really I'm tr really trying to get into problem solving mode. Um, because I, I very much concur with a lot of the concerns that you raise in both the written and oral submissions. Um, to what degree do you think that if the, the role, for example, of the chief nursing officer, chief um, dental officer, et cetera, et cetera, if their role was uh, enhanced into more like an office of, where they were more accountable in terms of the health outcomes, but also bring to that role within the Department of Health far more expertise and understanding of how nursing, for example, or social work or physiotherapy or whatever, how that's actually delivered in practice and, and the benefits that could bring. So it's really just about expansion of their roles. Thank you. Um, I'll have a go at that one, if, if, you, if that's okay. Um, I, I think you're right, Paul. I think, um, you know, going back, um, over the various changes and reforms that have happened across the health and social care system um, over the last 20 years, the one thing that hasn't really changed is the Department of Health in terms of its uh, senior management structures. There was a review that was carried out in 2006 on the top management group that recommended various changes in terms of the the membership and the profile and skills for the top management group within the department, and it was subsequently um, not taken forward. <laughs> um, so I think you're right. I think if you're going to look at changing and reforming and modernizing the entire health and social care system, I think that has to apply to the department as well. And we have raised the point with the committee on a number of occasions that as as regards allied health professions who represent the second largest group of healthcare professionals in the system, where we are represented within the departmental structures is not equitable to our nursing social work and nursing co um, medical colleagues. Thank you. Anyone else? Paula, if I could answer, um, I think the role of the CNO is very clear for us at the Department of Health. She is an advisor and she should advise yourselves and the minister in terms of what what should be done. Um, it would be there would need to be a complete change um, in that role because you can't be held accountable if you don't have authority. Um, and if you if to, to have authority, you need to have the ability to actually implement and then sanction if implementation is not uh, right. And that would require a complete change of that role from being an advisor to being an operationally uh, an operational manager um, and I don't know that that would be the right way to go with that I mean that would require I think a lot of discussion in the future um, for us uh, the the CNO gives the advice and then the people it is up to the, yourselves and and the trusts etc to take that advice and implement it um, she can only be held accountable for the advice she gives at this current moment in time. Um, she doesn't have a budget to, to implement any of the changes, et cetera. So unless there was a complete change of that role, I don't see that working. A, 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 sorry, just a thought. And I'm, I'm not, I haven't even really thought it through myself. It's just, it's just really to see where that accountability and, and making sure that all the issues are dealt yeah. with. Sorry, Lawrence, sorry. Yeah, no, sorry. I mean, I, I wouldn't like to, to, to comment about the CMO's role and so on, but I mean, generally, just would like to have a louder voice in public health issues. I mean, I think we have a huge amount to contribute to that. You know, we've seen we were used for the flu vaccine spotter practices and so on, and then we're seen with this vaccine. But there's a huge 
rules for general practice be involved in a wider discussion of public health and the range to our, to our communities. Thank you, panel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think actually even the, uh, the the onset of the pandemic sort of underlined and underscored how public health had been hollowed out in a, in a sense and taken out of maybe GPs and out of out of out of on the ground and the district nurses and even the contact tracing skills and ability you know wasn't 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 there and and I think that's something that that we could put a potentially positively look at in the future. Okay, I will go then next of all to Carol McKillen. Um, Carol Gorey, Lena Hall. Gormilaka de Carley, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, and some of the points that you have covered actually was, you know, annoying me, and it is annoying. First of all, I agree, Rita, with yourself. There's absolutely nothing wrong with the way in which the legislation is drafted. It's the interpretation and the implications. And unless you've got, and this is a point that you raised, Tom, unless you've got guidelines about governance, mm -hmm. and achieving an outcomes-based approach to health is going to be very difficult. Because even when an outcomes-based approach was in the last programme for government, massive targets were missed, and the inequalities deepened, and the gap widened. And there are many reasons for that. It isn't just about funding, although that's very important. But, you know, you, you, you have all mentioned workforce planning. And I'm not sure if you've seen some of the figures around agency staff. Mm -hmm. So how, in your opinions, are the, is that going to be tackled properly, the amount of money going into agency staff, if recruitment and indeed retention isn't given priority? Uh, and then the second question is, in relation to the public health agency um, in terms of commissioning plans to be approved, uh, the relationship at times would appear to be a bit distant from public health agency to practitioners across the board. And I'm talking about yourselves and others who aren't here. So how, what influence do you feel that the, that the that this bill should have in relation to strengthening those relationships to have better outcomes. Thank you. Um, if I could answer from the nursing point of view, the agency question first, Carol. Um, we're on record, obviously, as you know, of saying that the reason we're in the position we're in is years and years of um, uh, cutting, um, top slicing nursing. If there was savings to be made, it's because nursing is the biggest profession. Obviously, if you need to get money out of it, well, you can take it out of nursing. Also, the reduction. I mean, it's well rehearsed the reduction in student nurse numbers that went back, you know, 10, 15 years. Um, and the issue is that within Northern Ireland, a market, market forces have been created that make it much more, um, I suppose, um, I, I suppose much more uh, easy, I think, for, for, for nursing staff to say um, agency work. It's not easier, but it's easier to do because you have a work-life balance. You get more money and you go in and you, you do your shift and you come home. And, you know, you're not bringing a sort of responsibility home with you. So those market forces weren't created by nurses or nursing or indeed doctors. They were created by an absolute dearth of workforce planning that looked at what the population needs of Northern Ireland were going to be um, in this 10 years and the next 10 years. Um, and it was short term thinking that has got us into this position. Um, we, ha we are going some way within nursing. We've increased the number of students going in, but my big concern, and I've said this in a number of different rooms, we're doing nothing for retention. Mm -hmm. um, we have just got the NMC figures there of, recently of um, the number of joiners and leavers within Northern Ireland. We have a tiny, a tiny improvement in the amount of joiners um, and, and not really any improvement in the amount of levers. So we're just about at the minute keeping still um, where we need a lot more. We also have a lot of nurses who are going to be ready for uh, retirement in the next five years. Uh, I'm sure Lawrence can tell you the difficulties GPs mm -hmm. have with recruiting GP practice nurses and the, you know, the difficulties that we've had in making sure that the GPs can do the job that the GPs can do and are well supported by the, by the nurses. So 
it, workforce is going to be our main stumbling block moving forward for any anything that we want to do. The multidisciplinary teams work extremely well. But if, you know, so for example, the GP practices have brought in pharmacists, but mm -hmm. we didn't ever look at that as a new role. So we've the same amount of pharmacists coming out to, to, to now cover hospital, community and GP practices. So there's there's going to be a gap somewhere. We're, we're seeing the gap manifesting at the minute within the community. Pharmacies, a difficulty in getting our district nursing. Uh, we need a huge increase in district nursing, but we can't, we can't get it because we have one pool within Northern Ireland and we only ever recruited for the health service. We didn't recruit for the independent sector. And we've mm -hmm. more beds in the independent sector than we have in the health service. So, Rita, sorry. Huge. So when you're talking to safe staff, it's coming to my mind. Yes. So is there is there something that we could do, in your opinion, around this legislation, given the minister didn't bring forward the safe staff in legislation? Yes. Should well, that I, be covered, in your opinion, in the governance guidelines, as an example? It absolutely should. I mean, safe staff and legislation, I think, is what we're, we're going to need moving forward because it's absolutely essential that we get workforce planning right. Um, and as I say, the minister has been true to his promise. We have extra student nurses, um, but there is no short term fix for this. The, this is the problem. There's no short term fix. Um, so the, the issue of workforce, I'm sure Tom would say the same thing. You know, there's shortages everywhere, physiotherapies, occupational therapy, mental health nurses. There's a shortage of workforce everywhere. Um, and we are going to have to be honest with people and say workforce is going to be the, def the, you know, the deciding factor in what we can do and what we can't do moving forward for the public. And I, I agree 100%, uh, Rita. And, you know, everyone's well aware of the, the vacancies within nursing and general practice. From a physiotherapy point of view, our current vacancy rates are... Uh, as of December, about 11.8%, 12%. Uh, there's 182 v vacancies for physiotherapists. We currently train 60. Now, the shortfall there is is growing by the by the month, by the day. Um, we we were very thankful that the Minister for Health increased the number of undergraduates for physiotherapy from 60 to 89 last year. However, um, there was a further bid, I, I understand, put into the department to increase it by another 10 this year, which has been rejected, obviously due to financial considerations. However, um, as you say, Rita, the, 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 the fundamental problem that you're going to have in terms of commissioning is workforce and the lack thereof. And we currently um, do not have, we have a regional recruitment list, which is has been exhausted um, pr at present. So there's no one to recruit in terms of physiotherapy, band five posts at the moment until the next cohort comes out from the University of Ulster. Now, if you add to the fact that conversations we have had with our colleagues in the south of Ireland, they're in exactly the same position. Um, so we're going to be competing <laughs> with them for to try and attract whatever graduates there might be in England, Scotland and Wales who might want to relocate to either Ireland, north or south. Okay, um, anything further on that then, or are we... Uh, so I'll go then next to Arlea Flynn. Go ahead, Arlea, please. Thank you. Just, it just took a wee while there for me to um, unmute myself, Chair. Um, thanks very much to the panel and for your, your presentations. Um, I... I'll maybe just pose two questions for um, each of the each of the the panel there, if, if that's okay. So, the first one, um, and it did come up, I think, in Tom's um, comments earlier. Um, the first question, it's come up at previous briefings that we've had um, at the health committee in relation to this bill, and it was around the issue of commissioning. And I think it's whenever we met with the um, some of the officials around it, and. Um, 
we had asked the question if, because I know it's contained within the bill, that there's an appeals process for staff in terms of their contracts. But when we had asked if there was um, a appeals process for commissioning decisions, we were told um, at that particular se session the official wasn't sure if the Health and Social Care Board had such an appeals process in place. Um, now, I did send right to the Minister and he came back to say, so there is no formal appeals process um, in relation to commissioning decisions in the Health and Social Care Board. Um, and basically the answer saying that, you know, there is a planning process, you know, that um, that the trusts will, will engage with the board. And, you know, there's uh, it's, it was all to do with really like engagement. The trusts can engage with the director of commissioning, the chief executive. And if people have any concerns or complaints, that they can express their views to um, the relevant organisations or they can raise a formal complaint at any time. So what I'm basically asking each of the three of you is, is do, would you see, um, do you think it would be beneficial for this bill to contain um, a sort of specific appeals process or role in relation to the Commission of Services when it's fallen under um, this new management um, structure? That's my first question. And then the second question, um, I know each of you has raised your sort of your different issues that, that, you, that you and concerns that you have with the bill. But if there was one thing that you could um, change or enhance about this bill, um, in, in your opinion, in your view, what would be the most important thing um, that we could maybe amend or, or try to re restructure um, just in your, your own opinions? Thank you. So thanks very much. I think, um, I, I'm no expert on commissioning, but but I mean I am aware, and, and several of our GPs are, are play prominent roles in, in local commissioning groups. So they do. Uh, we're very much supportive in a robust uh, appeals procedure that has to be timely. These decisions they can't go on forever. It needs to be robust. It needs to be appropriate and, and timely, so that any appeals can't can't just roll on and roll on. There has to be a, a, a clear a clear cut with that and so on. Uh, in terms of the, the one big thing I would like to enhance is. is Definitely, with with the child protection and, and and the responsibilities for GP training, and that it needs to be clearly done so GPs have appropriate training, regular training, uh, and that that's clear. Our, our responsibilities are clearly documented in that, uh, so we can give you I mean these these people the support that they need in our communities. Thank and see just on that, Lauren. Sorry, see at present then. So the Health and Social Care Board and the current structure that they 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 currently would oversee that training for the GPs. And are you concerned that in this new structure, it's not really specified? It's not really specified, and again, there's the new safeguarding board for Northern Ireland as well, so it hasn't a rule hasn't been clearly linked into that as well, uh, and and that, that connects into a number of areas. But it's the it's the training and, and high GP. You're on. Thank you, Lawrence. That's clear. Thanks. Orlea, um, I, I suppose I would say if commissioning is done as it should be done, so it's based on population need, it's done by proper consultation with the people both who will be involved in delivering it, but who will be um, who will actually be service users. And if that's done completely with co-production, co-design, I would think there wouldn't be a need for an appeals process because it will have been done right from the beginning. Um, I certainly wouldn't would wouldn't if wouldn't rule out an, an appeals process, but surely if we're commissioning services, it should be based on that whole idea that we're commissioning services based on what we know as population needs. Uh, and also, I think we really need to move away from this idea that we, we commission for illness. You know, we should, we should have a service that is about maintaining health, promoting health, ensuring people don't get sick. So I think the commissioning process has to take into account that we need prevention mm -hmm. just as much as we need the hospital beds for the people who are acutely ill. Um, we, you know, um, we have to think about developing strong, healthy populations who can self-care because that's the only way we're going to be able to afford um, health in the future, that people take some responsibility for their own health. And I think any commissioning model that we, we move forward with has to have that as an underpinning principle. Um, and really, for the bill, I think what we what we would be seeking is more clarity around roles and functions and how these functions are going to be discharged. And um, 
as as Tom has said, a proper governance structure that enables us to see exactly where accountability and responsibility sits. And I suppose a, a, an assurance that the Department of Health isn't going to be marking its own homework. So there's some kind of scrutiny, independent scrutiny of the decisions that are made and how the money is spent and how the, how the commissioning happens. Thank you very much. Earlier, I, I would I would agree entirely with what Rita says, but again, I think it comes back to the lack of clarity around the commission model. Um, and we were told uh, some weeks ago, I think it was the 29th of April, Chair, that there would be a further information forwarded to the Health Committee on the details of the commission process. And, and then at the same time, we're told that uh, the commissioning um, model is at, a, is at an advanced stage and will be forwarded to the minister for his agreement. So I'm a bit confused about you know where exactly that fits at the moment, how advanced it is, what the, again what the details of that are in terms of governance. And the other issue I think, um, going back to a previous comment that someone made, in the past, the commissioning plan needed to be agreed between the Health and Social Care Board and the Public Health Agency. And how much is that going to continue to be a part of the commissioning process? I, I think it has to be a, a, an important part that the Public Health Agency has a, a you know a critical role in terms of the um, that process and input and agreeing what the commissioning model and what the commissioning plan is going to deliver at the end of the day. Thanks very much to the panel. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Orlea. And uh, the final indication I have at this point then is from Jerry Carroll. Uh, go ahead, Jerry Leonore Little Hull. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, panel. Um, just a couple of quick comments and, and, uh, and a, a question to yourselves. Um, uh, really, you said at the start about outcomes for patients need, needing to be key and uh, value for money and this department, uh, you know, mark on their own homework. And I suppose when you look at the agency bill waiting lists, they've, they've absolutely failed um, historically, but also there's a concern with this model um, that they'll continue to mark on homework and, and possibly fail with no repercussions. Um, so that's just an observation. Um, and I suppose I think I think it was RCN, Rita. Uh, you talked about the lack of detail about addressing health inequalities um, in this uh, model, and, and I, I and I'm sure others obviously are concerned about about that. Um, a further concern just is the fact that the MBTs are obviously the kind of the the, the go to and, and the kind of model for delivering care on on, on the ground, um, and. Probably, you know, I'm not the, the expert in, in, in assessing that, but it seems to be a, a quite a strong model. Um, but I'm, I'm concerned that there's a lack of them uh, in consistencies right across the north. Uh, the department, in an answer to myself, said that it's going to be at least uh, 2026 20, before they're fully uh, rolled out, possibly longer. Um, so I suppose really, uh, just to kind of tie that all together, I mean, is there a concern amongst... Um, yourselves that there could be a you know a swapping of one form of bureaucracy or another um that maybe doesn't deal with uh either either the commission of, of mdts the commission of services and ultimately the the, the dealing of, of waiting lists so would that be a, a kind of concern that you uh, may have yeah um I, um jerry i think you're, you're spot on there and I'm, I'm sure lawrence would agree with me that you know the multidisciplinary teams is is a a central component in terms of transforming and modernizing how services um, will be delivered in the future. But again, as I said, it comes back to workforce and the availability of staff with the requisite skills to be able to move into those roles. And we're sort of at capacity at the moment around uh, first contact physio, for example. Um, that's not to say that we can't resolve that, but it, it, it needs it needs to be resourced. It needs to be financed, um, and I think as well the vacancy problem that we experience at a lower level 
a lot of that relates to the fact that there's non-recurrent funding and a lot of staff are on temporary contracts and therefore you know inevitably there's that instability and they perhaps need to, to go and get a more secure um contract let's say and that's having a major impact in terms of recruitment we need to make those temporary staff um, permanent give them permanent posts in order to keep them there and to uh, allow them to progress through the system to provide the um, services that will be needed in the future yeah, thanks, Jerry. I mean, it's, it's an excellent question and, and our health inequalities badly need addressed, uh, particularly now. I mean, we're very concerned at the slow rollout of MDTs. Uh, it needs money. We need recurrent funding for this <clears throat> because it's very difficult to go out for jobs whenever there's only a, a you know, a, there's not recurrent funding attached to that. So it's really important and really important how the MDTs can address, I mean, the mental health of our, of our citizens, you know, who are, who are suffering so badly through social isolation, through reducing their jobs and so on, and, and who are coming to us for help. And we must have, you know, have better ways of serving them. Uh, we, we do risk uh, creating more inequalities, both uh, through our practices, where practices who have an MDT may suddenly become more more attractive for young DPs to work in than a practice that doesn't. So we, by, by slowing down the rollout, we actually introduce a new sense of, of health inequality. So, so so slowing down isn't isn't the option. We need to, we need to be speeding this up and it needs to be embedded you know, urgently. COVID has taught us that we can do some big things quickly. Uh, MDT should not be a challenge. And, and Jerry, I, I would agree to, to an extent, but I suppose one of the things that we learned when, when transforming your care was supposed to be the, the, the biggest show in town and the panacea, um, what, what we learned was there is going to have to be some way where we maintain two, and, and, and it's very costly, where we maintain two, two services before we can move directly into one if that's making sense so you know at the same you know we have our eds full to bursting point with people who require beds in hospitals who are very ill um may, maybe because they're older or they're sicker or whatever um so we have we still have to look after that population of of patients as well as moving forward with the new uh the new ways of working in terms of multidisciplinary teams. We're not we're not at a point where we can have one or other. We need both at this point in time. And the, it, again, it goes back to the whole workforce plan. And so for physios, for example, uh, the workforce plan and previously um, would have been based on probably hospital and outpatient. Um, and so we would have we would have um, commissioned students, uh, physio students for that service. Same as nursing, we mostly um, looked at um, recruiting students for the health service, but we completely forgot about the independent sector. That's the same pool of people that are expected to cover both. So the same with the pharmacists, the same at, at the minute we're operating, we're trying to operate two services um, or two different ways of working, if you like, our acute and our primary care with one pool of people. And it's mm. the same. Um, and so if, if the multidisciplinary team is expanded, we're all fishing in the same pool for the same fish. Um, mm. And so if we increase the multidisciplinary team, which is what we should be doing, it's the way to go. We are depleting the number of nurses or physios who are available to work in the hospitals. Um, we're reducing beds and therefore we've got EDs full to bursting point. It's it's a cycle that keeps continuing over and over again. Um, and we need somebody to actually take this on and say, look, there is probably a point where we're going to have to, we, we have to look at both ends of this and, and workforce plan for all of it with hopefully the view that in a couple of years or a, 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 probably a decade, we would be able to move more towards the whole primary care preventative. Um, but at the minute, we have to service the people who are, who are turning up at ED, who are very ill and who need beds. And therefore, that's why we have huge agency bills. Um, with people who are totally disillusioned. And there's another factor that I'm really concerned about, and that is this, those who can afford to pay are now paying. Um, and that's the growth of the, prime, uh, the private healthcare sector. But they're fishing in the same pool as well. So if we increase the number of, of, of private hospitals in Northern Ireland with the same pool of nurses and doctors and physios, to, to, to staff those places. So 
if you can pay, then you're getting the service. And if you can't pay, so I am con really concerned about that uh, as we move forward. That's a big concern. It's the same pool of people. Mm -hmm. um, if a private hospital pays more, the, the people will move to the private hospital. The staff will move, get more pay, and they'll do fewer and fewer, fewer hours in the health service. And where do we stand then? And just just a quick follow-up, Chair, and thanks, Andrea and, and, and panel. But I suppose it's the, the ironic is the ironic thing is that the department is, is allowing the health inequalities to exacerbate by allowing the private sector uh, form of, of healthcare to flourish. And as you said, people who can afford it can get treatment, which is the complete antithesis of what the NHS was, was founded. And I think also in the bill, there's there's nothing to deal with the um, the two to three thousand nurses uh, nursing vacancies uh, across our, our sector. But but thanks for your answers, panel. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, uh, thank you, members, and I think that is a, that is certainly a concern that not only as you have so eloquently put it, Rita, that the the private sector are fishing out of the same pool for the same fish, but also with better equipment and and uh, you know better bait, and I think that's that's a concern and, and something that we do need to be really careful on, um, because clearly um, the service needs to be delivered. Equitably across the across the entire north, across the entire sectors where, where people are needing it, and uh, I think that's that's a, an issue of concern for all of us. I have to say, um, but I think that's been a very very useful session today for members and some very significant issues raised, which I think uh, will contribute greatly to our consideration of all of it. Um, I'd like to wish all of you the very best in the time ahead and to uh, wish all, all the members who you represent the best in what continues to be really challenging, difficult times that, that we're operating in. And thank you for taking time out to assist the committee in our considerations this morning. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Take care. Thank you, sir. All the best. All the best. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, members, um, any comments or, or any thoughts in relation to that uh, section of our meeting and our consideration on the HSE? Okay, so listen, that, that I think that's a very useful perspective from, from very, very uh, relevant organisations. So I'll move on then, members, to correspondence. Um, just let me, yeah, so going on to correspondence item seven. There's a couple of items that I would like to, like to draw to your attention, members. Item 7.2 is a departmental response to the committee's request for information on child and adolescent mental health services. The response indicates that there are 900 children and young people on the waiting list for CAMS, with 381 waiting over the nine-week target. The response outlines some of the measures being taken to address the waiting lists. Do members have any comments they want to make in relation to that? Correspondence? Sure. Yeah, go ahead, Carol. Sure, just given some of the issues uh, around autism, around even just, you know, like the Alan Stout outlined about the, the demand for mental health services and all the rest of it, I actually think uh, that target's increasing exponentially at a rate well before pre COVID. So I'd like to see more information on that, and particularly given the role of the MDTs. Um, so I, I, I would like to see more information on that, Chair. I want to come back to another issue in relation to correspondence further on down. Thank you. OK, thank you. Are members content that we seek that further information? And would it also, I think, again, given how given how critical that issue is, and, and again, as we all know, a very, very significant focus in the Assembly recently on the autism and the difficulties in accessing those, would, it, would members agree that we request a monthly update on the progress of addressing those waiting lists just to keep it on our radar so we can keep an eye on, on how that's unfolding? So would members be content that we seek a monthly update? Thank you. Item sure. 7.5 then is... Go ahead, um, someone was looking in there. Uh, yeah, sorry, Chair. I'm just, I'm just thinking in relation to the, the, the letter that we got about the comms, um, it was just bringing my mind back to whenever we had the briefing from the departmental officials on the budget and i had asked um that they had come back in writing to, there was a number of points but one of them was around specifically the breakdown of the percentage or 
of the budget towards calms, mental health more broadly than calms, addictions and stuff. And I'm just want I don't know, maybe the clerk Keith will know, is that still being followed up on or is it something I would need to raise again? Chair, we haven't had a response back on that um, letter yet. We're still waiting that response. Hopefully it'll, it'll come back. I'm hoping this week in advance of any debates on the budget. So it is, so uh, I'll chase that up after today. No, that's great. Keith, cheers. Thank you, Ornea. Thank you, Clerk. Item 7.5 is a request from Bremar Training to meet with the committee to outline its new mental health program called Pitch. Um, and actually, that's, that's a, an, an organization that I contributed uh, recently to one of their training sessions. It's a really, really good initiative, I think, especially in terms of what we're talking about there around workforce. It's, it's kind of trying to uh, encourage encourage people into a better mental health to allow them to, to work in the community and voluntary sector and support them in that. So would members be content that an informal meeting be scheduled at some point, which all members then will be invited to attend? Yep. Thank you, members. Item 7.8 is from an individual in relation to the RQAA's review of neurology cases. Item 7.8. Do members have any uh, any comments to make in relation to that item of correspondence? Yeah, sure. Jonathan? Yeah, no, I, I, I assume like other members, I've been getting quite a number of emails in relation to this, uh, and particularly actually I've, I've received Collins as well. So I'd be keen for us to get a departmental update on the progress of this. Um, it is very alarming that it's taking so long, and uh, I think that it's only but right that we, that we as a committee uh, further probe this with department officials. Thank you, Jonathan. Carol? Yeah, I, I completely support that. Uh, and also, we have still to see the terms of reference for this public inquiry as well. Um, and we've also um, to receive, like beyond the statement that the minister made about a third recall, I, I mean, I'm getting asked lots of questions and people are in real distress. I, I mean, I just think we, we definitely need to see more detail. And if it's not all sorted out yet, we at least need to be told that it's work in progress. But just to make a kind of bland, not a bland, to make a statement without follow up and without detail is actually causing a lot of concern and a lot of distress, Chair. Okay, thank you. And as well as writing to the department asking for an update on those various issues, would members be content that we also write to RQIA to request an update of the review and any reviews that they are still undertaking in relation to neurology? They're they're separately doing a number of strands. So members yeah. are indicating, and Jonathan's looking back in. Go ahead. Yeah, no, it's just on that, and, and maybe uh, the clerk could keep me keep me right on this, but maybe before it's happened, but would it would it maybe also be good to hear from the the chair, Brett Lockard QC, as to an update? I I don't know if that's normally the way it's done at committees. I do know he had spoke to committee committee before before my time on it. Uh, maybe that might help clarify the direction of travel as Carol has outlined about terms of reference, etc. I think maybe an approach like that would help us in, in line with departmental officials. Well, could I suggest that maybe we take it as a two-part process? We ask for the written responses from both department or QAA, and then we see how we make or whether we wish to raise those with Brett Lockhart, yeah, Jonathan, that, would that be? That, that's no problem. I, I don't know whether... First. I don't know whether that would be appropriate or not. I'm just putting it to the committee I, I, if it's done before, if it's custom and practice. But again, I'm happy to take the lead from, from the clerk and the committee as to consensus on, on that. Yeah. And and I do know that, that while it is an independent and, and now indeed a public inquiry, Brett Lockhart has come to the committee and has has engaged very, very uh, constructively, I think, at, in, in the last uh, occasion. So. Um, that's that's it, it, there would be no uh, clerk. I'll take your view there in relation to would that be uh, would that be something that we could look at down the line following responses back from both organisations. Certainly, chair. If the committee um, are con content after, or depending on what the responses are back, certainly we can take that and request that um, Mr. Lockhart come before the committee. Yeah, there's no issue with that. Okay, thank you. Um, so, moving on to item 7.15 is from the Human Rights Commission providing a copy of its monitoring report on reproductive health care provision here in the North. 
The committee is due to consider the scheduling of oral evidence sessions in relation to the SFIA bill later in our meeting today, and it may be useful, members, if the NIHRC brief the committee on its response to the SFIA, that they could also brief us on this report when they are here given evidence. So would members be content with that? Yeah. And I just want to just check back then, Carl, is your additional item within table papers or the main correspondence pack? Sure, it's table papers. Okay, so I'll come back to you then uh, and table papers. Someone looking in there? Chair, it's Paula here. No. Um, it's in relation to yeah. 717 um, about the um, fertility, regional fertility service. I think um, I think we may have all received correspondence, not, not just in relation to that item, but um, I've heard some issues around the Belfast Regional um, Fertility Centre and I've, I've contacted the Chief Executive directly about that. But I, I do think this is a recurring issue. Obviously, we're still coming through the pandemic and rebuilding of, of services, but I'm just wondering what we as a committee can be doing to better support those women who are waiting um, for long periods of time to get um, access to IVF, etc. Thank you. Thank you. And and would it be would it be in order, Paula, maybe that we write again to the department asking them and, and highlighting the questions and forwarding that response, but also writing to them asking them to update us on, on the return and resumption of fertility services? Yeah, well, not to expand it too much, but I do think that it would be useful even if we could find out what each of the trusts individually over and above what they put into the re um, build plans that are on their um, websites. I do think it would be useful to get a more in-depth understanding of what, what each of the five trusts are doing, either in terms of their own services, but also then just, just wider support for women. So um, I'm not sure whether they want to do six okay. letters or want to ask the department to chase up the what the trusts are doing individually. Okay, well, well, if members are content, then we'll maybe leave that with the clerk to decide as to the best way to get that information, whether it's from the department or department and the trust individually. Are members content with that? Okay, I'm going then to Jerry. Carol, Jerry, do you have an item of correspondence? Adam, do you raise there? Just uh, I'm just deeply frustrated about the lack of uh, you know abortion services for for women here. The obstacles continually put in their way. I mean, we regularly had a session, you know, highlighting the the lack of or the difficulties with GP services that constituents face. That was obviously the correct thing uh, to highlight. But we have women here being told have to travel uh, in a pandemic to get access to services. So I just deeply frustrated about it. Um, and I think yeah. an approach uh, being taken, which is seeing this is not uh, a health care, or seeing it's something else, uh, something we have to just continue to highlight, but it's something that's deeply, deeply frustrating and causing a lot of concern amongst people that I'm speaking to. Okay, thank, thank you, Jerry. Okay, so I'm moving on then to table correspondence. Um, and there's just, yeah. I think, one item. Go ahead there, uh, who is, who's indicating? It's Pam, Pam, yes, is it? It's just yep, before you. Uh, it's relation to seven point one three there of the main pack. Um, uh, it's okay. Heather Erkington, she's a drama therapist, and as we are forwarding forwarding it to the Department for Common, I think that's good. And I think just in, kind of on the back of even of the comments from Doctor Stike today, you know that realization that there, uh, there's more to mental health and and mental illness. You know, there's much more in there, and I think. Uh, that you know, like the drama therapy, is a is would be a fantastic addition to our general um, mental uh, well being, and I think that that's the type of um, role that needs to be seriously considered within the department uh, going forward. So I'm just I'm just wanted to make a comment um, to that, and to, I'm, I'm glad we are for the department, but I think that, that in the round we need to take all these different types of therapies into consideration, not just mental health nurses. You know, the, uh, things the more serious side in terms of preventative and uh, good mental health well-being. I think it's a good thing that that we're looking at this type of therapy. Yeah, yeah, and I think actually the one, two, three GP session during Mental Health Week was really, really uh, informative in that regard, and, and I agree with you that there is a lot more, not only. A opportunity, but also outside of that core workforce. So there's a way to bring in additional people who can take Absolutely. pressure off the core workforce. Absolutely. So thank you for that, Pam. So table papers. Then there's there's one item. Um, then and within that, I draw members' attention to tab seven point one eight. Sorry, there's a couple of items here. There's a few items, but firstly, in table papers, tab seven point one eight, which is a response from the department to queries raised in relation to support to those with sight or hearing loss 
during the pandemic and the vaccination centres. So um, I know that uh, that was raised by Paula, but do members have any other comments in relation to that response? I, I noted one thing in it, that there is no response in relation to the provision of information in Braille, which I think was actually part of the, the, the initial inquiry. So would members be content to be right to the department to get further clarification on that issue? There was some indication about, about saying, but there was very little on Braille, so I think a bit further clarity. Also, a tab, members agree, thank you. Um, yes, uh, Pam, yeah. Yeah, sorry, just on that item, I uh, hadn't had a chance to read it properly, but... I was just I'm just wondering should we also be uh, writing to the Assembly Commission on these some of these issues because I know I've written along with um, um, with my colleague Gordon Lyons and around um, the deaf community and communication from the Assembly as a whole and access to communication to um, MLAs in terms of translation and I just think there is a there is a real quality issue here where um, where sometimes as assembly we're deciding what information is appropriate that needs to be translated, but actually all information and access to all committees, plenaries, uh, access to your MLAs, it should it should be as free as, as if you're English speaking or, or you're verbal. Uh, so I think uh, it may be um, it may be an opportunity actually to write information in the round provision and access to information in terms of equality for for deaf community and all those other groups that have disabilities which which really prevents them having um you know proper access to basic information yeah yeah our, uh, members content and i'm actually aware that the even mlas at times are with with some of the issues that they are facing are having difficulties at times so our members content we write to the commission and uh, request further information on that yeah Members are content, thank you. Yeah. So item ta at tab 7.9 then in table papers is a response from the department to questions raised during the health inequalities briefing. Also included is a copy of the presentation used during the meeting. Do members have any comments in relation to that? Sure, that's what I want. Go ahead. To You're looking in it, Karen. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, All that's right. the issue I wanted to come in on. Um, I, I, I'm just really deeply unhappy at the response. I mean, in the health inequalities, the, 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 the stats that we got, you know, certainly in North Belfast, a mile of a difference. Somebody's going to live five years less than somebody, somebody a mile up the road. A fella's going to live five years less, and a, and a, or sorry, seven years less, and a woman's going to live 4.8 years less if they live in deprived communities. It, I mean, we like th this is kind of you know, not coming down to those issues at all. Um, and the clear links between poverty and deprivation and poor health, and certainly poor health outcomes, needs to have a greater focus. And I don't see any of it, absolutely any of it, in that response we got. So I would like to see, Chair, if the committee could agree, in terms of better health outcomes to address inequalities, we need to, you know, go deeper uh, as a scrutiny committee and if it means calling more people and papers, then so be it. But this is an issue I think it just just can't can't be presented or left the way it's been presented here, in my opinion. Okay, uh, will members be content to that we seek further information and further detail in relation to this issue? I think it is it is a uh, it is relevant. And again, it's been touched on already today. If we don't measure it properly if we don't know what it is we don't know then how do we how do we come up with solutions so i think we do need to to get to more detail on that so thank you members item then tab 7.22 is a copy of a letter from the committee for agriculture environment and rural affairs seeking views and comments from all statutory committees on the climate change bill so our members content that we write to the department to request a copy of any response that it provides to the area committee on that bill are members content with that? Yeah, thank you. Okay, members, moving on to our forward work programme, and I refer you there to the draft forward work programme at tab 8.1 of your pack. Are members content to note the draft forward work programme? Agreed, thank you, members. Okay, and members, we, just one other item there. We have received a request in from the Justice Committee to allow them use of the Senate Chamber for all day meetings on the 27th of May, 10th of June, and 24th of June. Uh, 
so if the committees com could continue to meet fully virtual, this would have no impact on our committee meeting times. Would members be content to allow the Justice Committee the use of the Senate Chamber? Yeah, thank you. So moving on then, members, any other business in terms of today's meeting before we go into our closed session? Uh, Alan? Uh, yes, Chambers, uh, go ahead. Just uh, if we maybe take the opportunity today as a committee just to formally uh, register our appreciation and congratulations for the vaccinating program where they've hit that landmark this week of, of a million vaccinations. I think that's a tremendous achievement and, and I think it would be worthy of us to just to formally recognise that and, and show our appreciation for that target been met. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I don't certainly see any objection, I don't think, from members in relation to that. So I think we all very much welcome the uh, the progress that's been made on the vaccination on the vaccination issue. Um, it, it has actually just come to my attention as the meeting has been sitting that there has an issue has arisen in relation to people with uh, latex uh, allergy and some difficulties there. I'm not overly clear, but would members be be content uh, that maybe we maybe put in an inquiry in relation to that to ensure that anybody with a with a and that's quite a common in some ways allergy. So maybe if we would write to the department highlighting the concern and asking for more information in relation to addressing allergy issues with the vaccinations. Sure, just, uh, just on that point, when I I got my injection, that was one of the first questions. Uh, that the nurse administrating the, the, the uh, injection asked me, did I have a latex uh, allergy? I, I couldn't understand. I couldn't make a connection between latex and, and where it would where the allergy uh, w w would come in. But I think it's something to do just with the uh, the packaging that the uh, the vaccine travels in. It has contact with uh, uh, latex, but certainly it's uh, yeah worth uh, seeking a wee bit more information about it. Yeah. Okay. That that's that's a uh, very good. Okay. Thank you, members. So, um, I've no other indications there. So, date, time, and place of next meeting. Our next meeting will be on Thursday, twenty seventh of May at nine thirty a.m. via video link. So, thank you, members. And could I now ask you, clerk, to take us out of broadcasting, and we'll go into our closed session consideration of the severe fatal impairment. Ireland Assembly.